Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I call this uh, meeting to order. A quorum is present. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. I ask unanimous consent that Representative Villarakis be permitted to participate in the hearing today. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some items for our remote hearing. First, if you are experiencing connectivity issues, please make sure you or your staff contact our designated technical support so those issues can be resolved immediately. Members participating remotely must continue to remain visible on camera for the duration of their participation in the hearing unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render the member unable to fully participate on camera. It is committee policy that members participating remotely will remain muted when not recognized, just like turning your microphone on and off during an in-person hearing. This is out of courtesy to all members on the committee and so that background noise does not interfere with another member who is recognized to speak. When you are recognized, you will need to unmute your microphone and pause for two to three seconds before speaking so that your words are captured on the live stream. If you wish to have a document inserted into the record, please ask for unanimous consent and have your staff email the document to veteransaffairs.hearings at mail.house.gov. It will be uploaded to the committee document repository. Without objection, members will be recognized in order of seniority for questioning witnesses today. This will make it easier for me to ensure all members participating have an opportunity to be recognized. Does any member have a question about the procedures for this hearing? I'm looking, I do not see any objections. So I will, uh, we will proceed. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today, we come together to discuss critical legislation to address military toxic exposures. As I've said many times before, if America is willing to send our service members into harm's way, then our nation must be willing to ensure that we take care of all those who have borne the battle. For decades, Congress has created and expanded coverage of benefits for veterans living with illnesses as a result of toxic exposures during military service. Just last Congress, we were able finally to pass the Blue Water Navy Vietnam Veterans Act to expand coverage for veterans who served in the offshore waters of the Republic of Vietnam. We also added three additional disabilities to the list of presumptive conditions for Agent Orange exposure in the 2021 NDAA. Though this was a monumental change for impacted veterans, it took more than 40 years of tireless advocacy and waiting. We cannot let that happen to the next generation of veterans with toxic exposures. Every day, more and more veterans come forward publicly to speak out about their exposures during service. And we continue to hear about new toxins such as PFAS used in military firefighting foam. Despite countless studies, VA still says it requires more credible research before it will establish a connection between certain exposures during service and subsequent health conditions. As the evidence sometimes only as the evidence sometimes only anecdotal, suggesting illness and disease in veteran populations continues to pile up, the committee must examine how to best provide care and services to these veterans. It is abundantly clear that we must act now. And that is why I'm so glad that we are here to discuss this legislation today. My colleagues impressive, impressively have introduced uh, 15 bills that cover the gamut of issues in the toxic exposure space from the need to address airborne hazards and burn pits and additional presumptive disabilities for Vietnam veterans to looking at ways to revamp and improve VA's research and decision-making process as it relates to toxic exposure claims. The burden of proof shouldn't be on our veterans, and there's no reason why they and their survivors should have to fight VA for the care 
and benefits they've earned. And while I appreciate bills that address individual exposures, we cannot continue to tackle this topic one disability at a time and one exposure group at a time. We need to reform and overhaul the process within VA so that the agency can provide support to veterans without the need for continued congressional intervention. Today's hearing serves as an opportunity to continue the conversation with VA and other interested stakeholders to ensure that we consider all views as we craft comprehensive legislation. It is critical that we hear from experts and veteran stakeholders as we figure out the best way to care for all veterans who've been exposed to toxic substances, regardless of where or when they've served. Now, I wanna thank all the stakeholders that have actively assisted in the development of the bills on the agenda. It is through this collaboration that we can ensure the laws we enact provide veterans and survivors with adequate access to benefits. Addressing toxic exposures remains one of my top priorities for the committee this year, and I'm committed to advancing comprehensive legislation to address it this Congress. And with that in mind, I know I cannot accomplish this alone, and I'm pleased to see bipartisan support for many, beer, uh, many bills on the agenda, and to know that Senator Tester has also made this a priority and held a hearing last week to discuss several bills on topics similar to what we will be, what, what we will cover today. So I look forward to hearing from the witnesses to better understand the feedback and views of all stakeholders. I cannot say this enough. It is long past time we recognize toxic exposure as a cost of war. And I hope that 2021 will be the year we pass comprehensive legislation that meets the needs of all veterans, current and future, who are exposed to toxic substances while serving our country. Ranking Member Bost, I now recognize you for five minutes for your opening remarks. Ranking member, your uh, your microphone is not working. I don't know if it's uh, a technical problem or if it's, did you have it turned on? Let's try it. Do you hear it now? You can hear it now, so why don't you begin? All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, and I want to welcome our, witness, our witnesses here today. You know, we are here to discuss one of the, my top priorities, and that's caring for the veterans who are suffering from toxic exposures. Sometimes service members are exposed to dangers, not just from the enemy, but from the air they breathe, the water they drink, and the ground they walk on. For generations, veterans have struggled getting benefits and services from VA for those sorts of toxic exposures. Their stories are heartbreaking. On several occasions, Congress has stepped in to ensure that they get the care and compensation that they are due. We did the, that most recently with Blue Water Navy veterans uh, from Vietnam after they waited decades for the benefits they were they deserved. Today, we will discuss several legislative proposals that would create a pathway to care and benefits so future generations of toxic exposed veterans don't have to wait that long. Too often, toxic, toxic exposed veterans are denied care and benefits because there is not enough science to determine whether their condition is linked to their time in uniform. Establishing that connection could take years. Some veterans don't have that long. We need to help and help now. We must find a way to support them while VA and the scientific community continue to do their research. To that end, some of the bills we will discuss would establish new or amend existing presumptions of exposures. That would ease the burden on toxic exposed veterans to provide their that their to prove that their disability was caused by their service in order to receive benefits. Other bills would expand access to VA care for toxic exposed veterans. My bill, HR 2127, the Team Act, would do both. It would create a consistent process within the VA for establishing presumption of exposures. It would also allow toxic exposed veterans to enroll in the VA healthcare system. There are other bills on the agenda 
introduced by Republican colleagues, including Damasad Committee Ranking Member Nails, uh, Representative Zeldin, and Representative Westerman. And I'm grateful to them for being leaders on this important issue and working to improve the lives of veterans and their families. I'm eager to learn more about their proposals and those of our other colleagues. That said, all of them come with a heavy price tag. I look forward to working with my colleagues and the BSOs to find offsets for them. I'm disappointed that the VA did not provide cost estimates or written views on several, on, on several bills. I appreciate VA's efforts to review how the department cares for talking exposure veterans, but now is the time for action, not more talk. I hope VA is prepared to provide views and cost estimates uh, verbally today. Finally, I would like to recognize and extend my condolences to the minority witness, Mr. James Price, whose wife, Lauren, recently passed. Mr. and Mrs. Price are longtime constituents of Represent Representative Villarakis, who is also here with us today. Lauren was dedicated to helping toxic exposed veterans. She was one of them. She knew as well as anyone about the sickness and suffering that toxic exposure can cause. Lauren was a co-director of Viet Veteran Warriors. She was a determined and fierce advocate. She will be missed. Her legacy lives on through her family and her contribution to her fellow veterans. Jim is here to speak on Lauren, of Lauren's experience with toxic exposures, as well as his own. Jim, thank you for being here. There are countless veterans and families like yours who are waiting for help. Know that I'm committed to making sure that you don't have to wait much longer. And I know that many of the members on this committee are in that same uh, thought, thought process of trying to move through this process as fast as we can. With that, Mr. S Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Bost. I really look forward uh, to engaging with uh, you and uh, the minority on uh, this topic. I think we are on, we're on the precipice of doing a really, really important thing for America's veterans. Uh, so uh, we will now uh, continue uh, with our first panel where we'll hear from others who have sponsored legislation on today's agenda. We'll first hear from members of this committee, and then we're gonna hear from eight of our House colleagues. Uh, each member will have three minutes uh, to provide comments. Um, Ranking Member Bost, uh, you're recognized uh, for three minutes to present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you including my legislation, H.R. 2127, the Toxic Exposure in the American Military or Team Act on today's agenda. We're here today because veterans and their advocates have told us time and time again, the VA is falling short of its mission to care for toxic exposed veterans. When I was with ranking member of da when I was ranking member of DAMA committee, I heard from veterans exposed to burn pits about their struggling enrolling in the struggles enrolling in VA's healthcare system and getting a service connected rating for their disability. Why? Well, because the available science did not yet support their presumption. This, these veterans were afraid that they would have to wait decades like veterans of prior conflicts for the science to catch up with them. They were afraid it would be too late. And they were frustrated by the lack of transparency from VA about discussions to the uh, decision to expand presumptions that many allowed toxic exposure veterans to receive care and, comp and, and compensation. I heard their concerns and I share them. We need a system that works for the veterans today and tomorrow. The TEAM Act would create that system. My bill is the result of months of discussions with members of Congress, VA, veterans and military service organizations, particularly those in the TEAM coalition and others. The TEAM Act would create a reg regulatory framework that VA must follow for establishing presumptions of service connection related to toxic exposures. VA would also be required to publish uh, presumptive determinations in the Federal Register. Such publications would ensure that veterans and the public can review and comment 
on the reasons for DBA's decisions. Critic critically, the TEAM Act would allow toxic exposure veterans to enroll in the VA healthcare system. That would ensure that nothing stands between the veterans who are sick and the care that they, that they could save, that could save their lives. The TEAM Act would also uh, advance research into the health and effects of toxic exposures by authorizing the National Academies of Science reports and establishing toxic exposure commissions. Finally, the TEAM Act would man mandate outreach to the veterans and survivors and improve training for the VA staff. My bill would provide current and future generations of toxic exposed veterans with the assurance that they will be taken care of and will be a, they will have a place to turn for help. I welcome feedback on the TEAM Act. I would like to, to thank the 30 organizations within the TEAM Coalition that helped to draft this bill and, and who support it. And I would also like to ask unanimous consent for the TEAM Coalition letter of support to be uh, entered into the hearing record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Boston. It just occurs to me, uh, your military service and uh, your family's military service and what, you know, we are, I'm so thankful that our committee uh, has uh, so many veterans uh, on, you know, has so many veterans serving on the committee. And that includes uh, uh, Chairwoman Luria of the Disability and Assistance Memorial Affairs Subcommittee. Uh, I wanna recognize you uh, for three minutes to present your bill. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking Member Boss, uh, my fellow HVAC colleagues, and our distinguished guests. I appreciate time to speak uh, today in support of the Conceding Our Veterans Exposure Now and Necessitating Training Act, also known as the Covenant Act, legislation to ensure that our nation's veterans can receive the benefits they deserve after being exposed to toxic substances in the course of their service. Mr. Chairman, protecting the quality of life of our veterans is a top priority of this Congress, as you've stated this morning, and particularly for my colleagues on the House Veterans Affairs Committee, where I chair the Disability Assistance and Memorial Affairs Subcommittee. One such veteran that I have the privilege of representing, Master Sergeant Brian Graves of Virginia Beach, flew missions over the Middle East for the United States Air Force. And today he lives with breathing problems after inhaling jet fumes and being exposed to other toxins during his service. The Covenant Act will dramatically streamline the VA benefits process for thousands of veterans like Master Sergeant Graves. For instance, the Covenant Act would concede exposure to certain airborne hazards based on service in certain locations throughout the Middle East and beyond, ensuring that the burden of proof of exposure is lifted from the veteran. It would also recognize certain illnesses, such as respiratory conditions and cancers, as presumptive for disability benefit purposes. It would establish a standardized compensation and pension examination and medical opinion process for non-presumptive toxic related conditions claimed by eligible for former service members. And it would also establish a standardized medical training curriculum for airborne hazard related compensation and pension evaluations, establishing continuity in the VA determinations whether that exam is conducted from coast to coast, from Loma, Lema, Loma, Lema, Loma Linda, um, to here in Hampton Roads. And the Covenant Act would provide um, its covered veterans with access to Priority 6 Veterans Health Administration hospital care, medical services, and nursing home care. Mr. Chairman, between June 2007 and February 2021, we know that 13,900 veterans filed disability benefit claims related to toxic exposure. Of those nearly 14,000 veterans, only 4,000 claims were granted. And that is simply unacceptable, and we cannot allow history to repeat itself. Veterans like myself watched our peers who served in Vietnam wait decades for the benefits they deserve. The recent veterans who served in the Middle East, Southwest Asia, East Africa, and the Philippines need our help today. They are hurting, Mr. Chairman, and sometimes they are dying from these conditions. Congress must not continue to neglect them in their time of need. And we must recognize these measures of assistance and care are a cost of war. 
That is why I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the Covenant Act, a comprehensive approach to securing benefits for those veterans exposed to toxic substances overseas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Chairwoman Luria. Uh, I, I now would like to uh, recognize the ranking member of the DAMA subcommittee, uh, ranking member Nels, you're recognized for three minutes to comment on your bill. Uh, Chairman Takano, uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I am very encouraged to see the committee hosting this important uh, hearing on toxic exposure legislation. As a veteran myself, I've seen how service members are affected by toxic exposures, uh, both during and after uh, their time in service. Uh, we must develop a process uh, at VA that provides benefits and care to these veterans for conditions that are linked to their service. That is why I am honored to have the opportunity to speak on my bill, HR 2530, the Talk Atoll Cleanup Radiation Study Act. I would also like to thank uh, Dama Chair uh, Luria for her support on this bill as the lead Democrat co-sponsor. For those who do not know, in the 50s and 60s, the United States resettled the inhabitants and conducted more than 40 atomic tests in the Enuitak Atoll, which is located in the Marshall Islands. When these tests ended in 1962, many of the inhabitants wanted to return to their homes. However, the area was contaminated by radiation and had to be cleaned up before it could be resettled. From 1977 to 1980, a group of service members worked, worked very hard to clean up the atoll so it could be returned to the residents. Unfortunately, many of the veterans involved in the cleanup now have illnesses they believe are connected to potential radiation exposure from working and living on the island. They have also discussed their challenges receiving benefits and care through VA for these conditions. Now, the VA often denies these veterans compensation benefits because DOD data found that they were not exposed to harmful levels of radiation. However, during a roundtable, then DAMA Chairman Boss in the 115th Congress, along with the National Academies of Science or NAS, reported concerns with the accuracy of DOD's methodology. No veteran, no veteran should be denied benefits based on outdated or incorrect science. HR 2530 would address these questions by requiring VA to partner with NAS to examine the adequacy of DOD study. NAS would also provide a new estimate for the amount of radiation these veterans may have been exposed. Additionally, NAS would explain whether it recommends further research into their exposure. Lastly, the VA would be required to report to the House and Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs any actions it plans to take based on the NAS study. This bill is the critical first step ensuring these veterans receive the benefits they have earned. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to speak on my bill. With that, I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Nels. I really do appreciate uh, your passion for this topic. Um, I continue to be impressed by the bipartisan commitment. I also want to acknowledge your service to our country, as I did with uh, uh, with Ranking Member Bost and with uh, Chairwoman with Chair Luria. Uh, I now would like to uh, call on uh, the chair of our Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, uh, Chairman Pappas. Uh, and I recognize you for three minutes to comment on your bill. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Boss, for the opportunity to testify today in support of my legislation. It's H.R. 2742, the PFAS Registry Act. This bill, which I introduced alongside a bipartisan group of colleagues from the House PFAS Task Force, would direct the Department of Veterans Affairs to create a national database for service members and veterans with health concerns due to potential exposure from PFAS. These forever chemicals persist in water sources, have been known to increase serious risk of health conditions, including cancer. 
PFAS contamination is particularly prevalent on and near uh, active and former military bases due to the use of PFAS containing firefighting foam by armed services. In recent reports, the Department of Defense has identified more than 600 military installations and surrounding communities whose drinking water may be contaminated with PFAS. One such example in my district is the Pease International Trade Port, which formerly served as an Air Force base and now has serious environmental and uh, groundwater contamination. Uh, people for years were drinking contaminated water on that base. And actually just yesterday, I was at the dedication of a new drinking water treatment facility that's delivering clean water to that area. But more needs to be done to deal with the legacy contamination and the health concerns that individuals have. Service members, veterans, and their families who served at places like Pease, as well as 600 other installations across the country, deserve to have access to the latest updates about recent scientific developments on PFAS, the availability of possible treatment options, and information on what resources may be available to address their health concerns. With the scientific and public health communities continuing to learn about the risk of PFAS, and um, uh, you know the data that's coming out of late, I think it's really critical that we pass this PFAS Registry Act, Act and establish um, a database to ensure that all those who may have been exposed to this contamination through their service to our nation can stay up to date on the information and potential treatment options. By doing so, we can protect the health and well-being of those who have worn the uniform of this country. So I'm really grateful for the bipartisan support on this bill. Uh, the way that VSOs have um, chimed in in favor of it. Uh, and I'm grateful that uh, we are having this opportunity to put a variety of legislative op opportunities on the table to make sure we're doing all we can to address contamination uh, among uh, our veteran population. So I thank you for this opportunity and I yield back my time. Thank you, uh, Chair Pappas. Uh, I will now like to turn to uh, Representative Slotkin, who was a uh, before coming to Congress, was uh, part of our intelligence uh, service, and we also thank her for her service to our country. Uh, Representative Slocken, you're recognized for three minutes to comment on your bill. Thank you, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boss, to the members of the committee for the opportunity to speak on H.R. 2436, which is the Veterans Burn Pits Exposure Recognition Act. Um, first, I want to thank the committee for taking on the issue of toxic exposure in this Congress um, and our, our commitment to working on it in a bipartisan way is just a really important signal to our veterans. Um, and I'm really encouraged by the conversation that we're having today. Um, I've heard a ton of painful stories across my state about those who are suffering from toxic exposure due to these burn pits um, that uh, many of us serve next to when we were serving abroad. Um, and then the fight with the VA that they then have just to get um, an acknowledgement, a basic um, uh, awareness of the care that they need. This issue is close to my heart. I served three tours alongside the military and lived near a burn pit. Um, all three of those tours, my husband was 30 years in the army and my stepdaughter is a brand new army officer. I literally think about her um, and what she will have to do one day if she's exposed and, and the fight that I don't want her to have to have with the VA. Um, so uh, for years, this has been common practice. We dump whatever we have um, in terms of waste, everything from human waste to batteries to jet fuel in these burn pits. Um, and service members are exposed to constant, um, the constant fumes that are coming off of those um, uh, of those pits. To be very direct, I believe that burn pits are our, our generation's Agent Orange. Just as previous generations um, were exposed to Agent Orange in their service um, and had to fight to get coverage and acknowledgement, that is what I feel like we're doing today with burn pits. Um, that's why back in April, um, myself and Congressman Peter Meyer from Michigan, who also served in Iraq alongside burn pits, introduced this bill to make it easier for veterans to cut through the red tape. Right now, the burden of proof is on the uh, veteran to show that toxic exposure. Um, and to put this in context on Agent Orange, it, we passed legislation in 1991, 39 years after many people served. And for Blue Water Navy, 57 years after they served, they finally got acknowledgement for this exposure. Under our new law, the VA would be required to perform a medical exam to consider the effects of those chemicals, there would be a list of countries where people were exposed. 
Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that this is going to be a part of what I think will be landmark toxic exposure legislation, something that will be transformative on the issue of burn pits, PFAS, a whole other thing, and an acknowledgement that we have to do something now and learn from the lessons of Agent Orton for our veterans and for our VA. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Slotkin, and I agree with you. I do believe we're on the precipice of doing something monumental uh, for our nation's veterans. Uh, I now would like to recognize someone who, uh, you know, there's no one with greater passion uh, for our America's, for America's uh, veterans who've been exposed to burn pits, uh, stands alongside uh, Representative Slotkin, uh, my good friend uh, and neighbor, uh, Dr. Ruiz, you're recognized for three minutes to comment on your bill. Thank you, Chairman Takano, for your work and leadership on toxic exposures. Look, veterans are dying as delayed casualties of war or suffering from permanent disabilities from their exposures to carcinogens and other toxic chemicals emitted from burn pits used by the military. This is a Department of, of Defense self-inflicted wound. As an emergency physician and public health expert, I understand the science and urgency to act and save our veterans' lives. That is why I recently reintroduced with Republican Representative Fitzpatrick and Senators Gillibrand and Rubio the bipartisan bicameral HR 2372, the presumptive benefits for war fighters exposed to burn pits and other toxins act of 2021 to get our veterans the care they need and deserve. Under current law, a veteran who has an illness or disability must establish a direct service connection in order to be eligible for VA benefits. That means that after serving and sacrificing for our nation, Veterans exposed to burn pits face a cumbersome and in many cases impossible burden of proof to provide enough evidence to establish a direct service connection between their health and exposure. We can and must do better. And my bill offers the most comprehensive coverage for our veterans by removing the burden of proof from the veteran. To receive presumption of service connection, a veteran would only need to submit documentation that they received a medal associated with the global war on terror or the Gulf War and that they suffer from a qualifying health condition. Additionally, my bill would grant a veteran health care for burn pit exposure ailments and for other toxic exposures, disability compensation, and death benefits to a spouse or dependents. This is the most aggressive and comprehensive legislative initiative aimed at tackling the immediate healthcare crisis that too many of our veterans are facing. I first learned of the effects of burn pits when one of my constituents, Jennifer Kepner, 39 year old Air Force veterans with a healthy lifestyle, no other risk factors came to my office for help. She was battling pancreatic cancer with her oncologist determined was likely linked to exposure to burn pits. I sat with her in her home as she told her story, and I can tell you that was one of the most impactful kitchen table conversations I've ever had. She spent her last month as a leading voice for her fellow veterans exposed to burn pits, which she called the Agent Orange of our generation. I was at her bedside with her husband and two children when she died on October 18, 2017. Her story continues to be an inspiration in this fight to protect veterans and their families from the pain and suffering she experienced, both from burn pits and from her difficult experiencing navigating the VA. As an emergency physician, I can tell you that in science and medicine, we know that if you have a high enough suspicion of an agent that causes a severe enough consequence, then you need to act on that suspicion. We have, according to the literature uh, and science, enough suspicion and veterans are dying. Therefore, we need to act this Congress to provide the relief, the care that our veterans need. With that, I thank you and I yield back my time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ruiz. Uh, I now uh, would like to uh, recognize a representative Westerman for three minutes to comment on his bill. Re Representative Westerman, you recognized.
apparently uh, Representative Westerman uh, is not on the is not on the, um, the Zoom site yet, so we will uh, move on to recognize Representative Lynch, and if Mr. Westerman comes back, we'll recognize him. Uh, Representative Lynch, you're recognized for three minutes to comment on your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also Ranking Member Bost. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of H.I. 1355, which is the K-2 Veterans Care Act. I'd also like to commend Chairwoman Luria and Ranking Member Nels of the Subcommittee on Disability Assistance and all of the members of the committee for your commitment uh, to improving the lives of America's nearly 20 million veterans. Uh, earlier this Congress, and, and I think you said it best, Mr. Chairman, you said that the burden of proof shouldn't be on our veterans, and there's no reason that they and their survivors should have to fight the VA for the care and benefits they've earned. And that, that sums it up. That's the situation we're in. As the chairman of the Subcommittee on National Security, I certainly agree with your statement. It's in line with this committee's landmark efforts to ensure that American veterans receive the health care and benefits that are commensurate with their service to our country. I introduced K2, the uh, K2 Veterans Care Act with my colleague, uh, Representative Mark Green of Tennessee, who served at K2 and also uh, has publicly acknowledged he's, own, he's also suffering health uh, uh, effects of his service there. Uh, this legislation has over 70 bipartisan co-sponsors. As most of the members understand, especially on the Veterans Committee, uh, between 2001 and 2005, there were more than 15,000 American service members that deployed to Kashi Kanabad, or, or K-2, which is a former Soviet air base in southern Uzbekistan to provide operational and strategic support to the U.S. mission in Afghanistan right after September 11th. So these were some of the first people on the ground. As evidenced by declassified documents released by my subcommittee, these dedicated servicemen and women were exposed to multiple toxic chemicals and radiological hazards during their deployments, including dangerous petrochemicals, volatile organic compounds and depleted uranium, and also burn pit smoke, which has also been the subject of this morning's hearing. In the years following their service, more than 400 K2 veterans have self-reported multiple forms of cancers and debilitating illnesses, also very rare cancers, brain cancers. Uh, many of these veterans have been diagnosed later in life. Uh, as a result, the burden of proof falls to the individual veteran when applying for health care or disability benefits uh, from the VA to demonstrate that his or her illness is service connected, which more often than not results in a denial. The K2 Veterans Act would remedy this wrong. The bill would establish a presumption of service connected uh, disability and require the VA to provide hospital care, medical services and nursing home care for K2 veterans uh, for diseases or illnesses associated with exposure to jet fuel, vol volatile organic compounds, burn pit toxins and other toxic substances all of which were known to have been present at K2. The legislation is narrowly tailored to those veterans who deployed to K2 and has been endorsed by various veterans service organizations, including the Stronghold Freedom Foundation, which has done great work on this, the VFW, the DAV, and the Wounded Warrior Project. I wanna thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and to the members of the Veterans Affairs Committee for allowing me this opportunity to testify in support of HR 1355. I'm happy to answer questions that members may have, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lynch. And I, I neglected to highlight uh, your role as the chair of the, the chair of the subcommittee on national security on the oversight committee. And you certainly bring um, your insights and experience to the legislation which you're presenting to us today. We thank you for that. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Um, we now, I, I understand that the Rep Representative Westerman is with us now. Uh, Representative Westerman, uh, I, now, I want to recognize you for three minutes to present uh, your legislation. Thank you, Chairman Takano and, and Ranking Member Boston. I uh, apologize for the technical difficulties earlier. I was on and then I was, was off. But I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to the Veterans Affairs Committee about how toxic exposure has affected many veterans and how my bill, the Keeping Our Promises Act, will ensure Vietnam era veterans exposed to Agent Orange receive the proper benefits they have earned. Specifically, the bill will codify six diseases for the VA to recognize as eligible for benefits 
due to toxic exposure. Five of these conditions have suggested suggestive evidence of an association and the six hypertension is proven to have sufficient evidence of an association. This science-backed evidence is determined by a biennial National Academy of Sciences report commissioned by the original Agent Orange Act of 1991. The VA is required to make benefits recommendations based on these reports, but has failed to properly include these diseases despite the proven evidence. The Keeping Our Promises Act will provide these benefits and bar costs from being a factor in adding future diseases. Additionally, this bill will reauthorize the VA Secretary authority to grant a presumption of service connection based on the National Academy of Sciences reports and all other sound medical evidence available. Lastly, the bill will ensure veterans and survivors of veterans who are currently receiving compensations for a connected disease will continue to receive compensation and care even if the VA decides to remove a disease from the presumptive diseases list. Providing benefits and care to our servicemen and women is a duty that we must honor, and I am proud to lead the charge. I introduced a previous version of the Keeping Our Promises Act in the 116th Congress and was glad to see 59 of my bipartisan colleagues sign on as co-sponsors. Thanks to our advocacy, we were successfully able to include three more diseases to the presumptive list of Agent Orange exposure through the 2021 NDAA. This is a great step and I hope we continue to follow the science and expand the list to these other diseases with suggestive or sufficient evidence. Thank you for the time speaking on this important matter and I hope the committee and my colleagues will continue to show support and advocacy for our Vietnam veterans. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a letter of support from the Military Veterans Advocacy, which includes support from my bill, HR 2268. Without objection, uh, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Westerman. Uh, we appreciate your contribution to today's hearing. I now uh, would like to uh, uh, call on uh, a, a representative who is not a member of our committee, but, all, but who also served in um, uniform for our nation as also a veteran. Uh, I'd like to recognize Representative Zeldin uh, to present uh, for three minutes on his legislation. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Takano, uh, Ranking Member Bost, and the entire House Veterans Affairs Committee for inviting me here today to speak about H.R. 1273, the Bipartisan Vietnam Veterans Liver Fluke Cancer Study Act. While our courageous service members were deployed to Southeastern and Eastern Asia during the Vietnam War, many of them consumed raw or undercooked freshwater fish. Preliminary reports indicate that those veterans could be carrying the dormant parasite commonly known as liver fluke. The liver fluke parasite has in several instances led to the contraction of serious life-threatening health conditions such as bile duct cancer and liver disease. A 2018 study at the Northport Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Northport, New York conducted a first of its kind study of liver fluke in the United States using a 50 veteran sample size. While the sample size was admittedly smaller than most studies, initial results highlight a substantial need for a greater examination of this issue, the development of standardized treatment options and broader access to care for veterans at VA facilities across the country. The Vietnam Veterans Liver Flu Cancer Study Act would require the Department of Veterans Affairs in conjunction with the Centers for Disease Control to conduct a larger study to help determine the prevalence of liver fluke amongst the Vietnam era veteran population and the link between a veteran service record and affliction. Our nation's veterans have earned nothing less than the highest quality care and it is our responsibility as Americans to develop a plan, secure funding to test all veterans whose service exposed them to liver fluke, and if necessary, provide appropriate care and to do so as soon as possible. It's absolutely critical that we tackle this issue head on the clock is ticking. I've heard from countless veterans, not only in my own district, but from around the country who have been pushing the VA to take action on this matter for years, all while battling uh, bile duct cancer and liver disease. This isn't right. We can and must do better. I thank the committee for your continued support and advocacy on behalf of America's veterans and all the incredible VSOs and nonprofit organizations for their support of this bill including 
the Wounded Warrior Project, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, VFW, Minority Veterans of America, Military Officers Association of America, Paralyzed Veterans of America, Vietnam Veterans of America, Military Veterans Advocacy, and the Colangio Carcinoma Foundation. I look forward to working with all of them and all of you on the committee to ensure our veterans receive the care they have rightfully earned without delay and without tribulation. Thank you for, again for holding today's great hearing. It's an honor to be part of the committee for today's discussion. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Zeldin. We appreciate your contribution to today's hearing. Uh, I now would like to uh, turn to recognize um, uh, a friend and colleague from the state of New York, uh, Representative Tonko, to present um, on his legislation. Representative Tonko, we can't hear. He might have accidentally. Representative Tonko, we can't see. Is your camera turned off and we can't hear you? I am here, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I had a little bit of difficulty, but I'm back on, I think. Can you hear me? Yes, and I, I just want to point out to, to everyone that uh, you also chair the subcommittee on energy and commerce on the environment. Uh, and so obviously there's a clear expertise uh, in terms of toxic exposure. So we, we welcome your insights and we welcome uh, your participation today and you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I come before you to advocate for the thousands of veterans who served at Fort McClellan in Anniston, Alabama, and who are seeking to understand the long-term severe health impacts they have suffered as a result of that service. Fort McClellan and the neighboring city of Anniston, Alabama, have been designated as one of the most polluted sites in the nation. Until its closure in 1999, Fort McClellan was a U.S. military chemical and biological weapons training center, and for much of the same time, the location of the United States Women's Army Corps and Military Police School. In addition to that chemical and biological weapons exposure, the fort was situated just miles from an enormous chemical manufacturing plant that spewed tons of PCBs into the air, soil, and water until 1971. This contamination remains a hazard still today. When I was first elected to Congress in 2008, I met with a constituent who, like many women who served during that period, was stationed at Fort McClellan in the 1970s as part of the Women's Army Corps. As my office investigated this issue further, we heard from hundreds of America's service veterans from all over the country who had served at Fort McClellan and later experienced often devastating health issues consistent with PCB and other forms of toxic substance exposure. Conditions those veterans have reported include various forms of cancer, multiple sclerosis, uh, fibromyalgia, uh, diabetes, heart disease, and numerous other reproductive, autoimmune, and neurological problems. Yet while there have been numerous studies detailing the adverse health impacts of PCB exposure for residents of nearby Anniston, amazingly, no comprehensive study has ever been conducted on our veterans who served at Fort McClellan. These veterans served and sacrificed for us, and they have paid a terrible price for it. We owe it to them to do better. So I have introduced legislation H.R. 2825, the Fort McClellan Health Registry Act, that would notify current and former service members who served at Fort McClellan that they may have been exposed to one of these dangerous substances and create a voluntary health study to assess their health conditions and claims. Over the years since that constituent brought this matter to my attention, our call to support our Fort McClellan veterans has drawn the support of more than 100 members of Congress, veteran service organizations, and grassroots organizations. Yet despite that overwhelming support and equally profound levels of public health evidence, we have made little progress until this point. After more than 10 years of work on this legislation, and with the support and counsel of many members of this committee, we are finally taking critical steps to determine the best way to address service-connected illnesses that have plagued the lives of far too many. I want to personally thank those of you on this committee on both sides of the aisle who have given your support to this pro-veteran legislation in the past and for this current coordinated effort to bring attention to the challenges 
facing our veterans across the nation who continue to suffer from exposure to toxic substances. Our task here is simple. Let's get the basic information that we need to affirm this link and help these veterans get the care they deserve. I know there are differences of opinion on the best way forward, whether through a registry or some other method to give the impact in Fort McClellan veterans a path forward. While I do not pretend to have all the answers, I am eager to work with anyone from either party to build a solution that makes real progress for the veterans who have been struggling for so long. Based on the many thousands of veterans who were stationed at Fort McClellan across multiple decades, the odds are very good that everyone on this committee has Fort McClellan veterans in your district. Many will have similar stories. Nearly all are frustrated. They need us to act now and make this right. This is not a local problem, this is a national problem. And caring for our veterans is not just the right thing to do, it's our job and our duty. And if anyone here has the, the lingering doubt uh, about that, then this is a debate worth having. So I urge this committee to take swift and decisive action to advance the Fort McClellan Health Registry Act or any related legislation that would meaningfully address the needs of the Fort McClellan veterans. With that, Mr. Be uh, Mr. Chair, I thank you for your service to our veterans, for your outstanding leadership, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, you went slightly over, <laughs> but uh, but uh, Chair, Chair Tonko, let me just say that uh, I actually do have Fort McClellan veterans in my district. They've come to my uh, town halls, and we actually have a Fort McClellan veteran on the Veterans Committee staff, majority staff. And I thank you for your many years of championing this issue. I know this is not the first Congress that you've introduced this legislation. So we thank you for your passion. We thank you for your commitment to America's veterans. Uh, well, thank you for your flexibility, Mr. Chair, too. I appreciate it. I apologize, but it's a very strong fight that's worth fighting. I didn't have the heart to stop you. So go ahead. Um, thank you. I, I, now, I, now, I now call on uh, Representative Cartwright uh, uh, who is uh, uh, chair of our CGS subcommittee uh, on appropriations. And uh, uh, Representative Cartwright, I recognize you for three minutes to present on your legislation. Thank you and good morning, Chairman Takano. Uh, can you hear me? I can, we can hear you, sir. So Very good. Please. And, uh, uh, we Again, can't thank see you, though. Chairman Takano. Can you turn on your camera? Is it possible for you to turn on your camera? Is my camera not showing me? You can't, yeah, the, I don't see the camera on. All right, hang on. There it is. You've now turned on your camera. Okay. Okay. Uh, now it's turned off again. Now it's turned off again. All right, I'll make it quick. This, uh, this is uh, about HR 2569, uh, Chairman Takano and Ranking Member Bost and members of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. Uh, I can tell you that uh, this is the Veterans Agent Orange Exposure Equity Act. And what this does is that it levels the playing field for uh, Vietnam War era veterans who served in Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia. Uh, you know that we have uh, opened up avenues of compensation for Agent Orange exposure for Vietnam War veterans, including uh, in the, the Blue Water uh, Navy veterans uh, have now been uh, allowed to put in for compensation for Agent Orange exposure. Um, and it uh, and the burden of proof is uh, is is lessened. There are presumptions that are allowed for Vietnam War veterans, including Blue Water Navy veterans. Uh, these do not apply if you don't if you haven't served physically in Vietnam. Now we know that uh, in those three countries, Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand, Agent Orange was used and it was stored. And we know that a lot of uh, veterans who served in those places were exposed to that. Uh, and so this is a bill to uh, level the playing field for our American veterans who, uh, through no fault of their own, were exposed to Agent Orange and also through no fault of their own, served in those places and not within the physical confines of, the, of Vietnam itself. 
And so this is a, this is a very important bill because these people suffered every bit as much as people who served in the physical confines of, of Vietnam. Uh, and so uh, I'm very proud to introduce this legislation and I seek the blessing of, of your august committee uh, for my legislation. Thank you so much. Well, I've, I've never heard the committee called August, but uh, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Cartwright, for your uh, contribution today. And we always like the, uh, the friendship of appropriators, especially cardinals uh, on this committee. And so uh, we thank you for your contribution today. Uh, uh, I now would like to uh, recognize uh, a fellow teacher uh, and somebody who, when she came to Congress as the first African American ever to be elected from the state of Connecticut, uh, someone who understood instinctively my concerns about student veterans, and we've worked together uh, to revise and to reform uh, the way for profit colleges uh, operate in our country. And uh, we, we, we've worked together on that legislation. Uh, I welcome her today to present on her legislation related to toxic exposure, uh, Representative Hayes from the state of Connecticut for three minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for holding this hearing and for welcoming me here to talk about my bill, the Palomares Veterans Act. Before coming to Congress, and unfortunately, like many Americans, I was unfamiliar with the 1966 nuclear accident at Palomares, Spain, where over 1,600 service members were exposed to dangerous levels of radiation. I cringe as I say that because I am a history teacher um, by training, so the fact that my class and my students never discussed this really speaks to the issue here about how little um, emphasis is placed on this event. And it wasn't until speaking with veterans and veteran service organizations and the Yale Veterans Legal Service Clinic that I became fully aware of the incidents in Palomares, Spain. For those who do not know, over 55 years ago, a B-52 bomber collided with the KC-135 tanker aircraft over the Spanish village of Palomares, resulting in one of the largest nuclear disasters in history and causing radiation exposure to approximately 1,600 US airmen who responded to the crash. These airmen were sent to respond to this nuclear accident with little or no protective clothing and were not warned of the potential dangers. They were ordered to clear the contaminated crops, shovel tainted soil into burden pits, and consume the local food and water, placing them in direct contact with large amounts of plutonium. Decades later, many of these airmen are suffering and dying from the health conditions that likely came from handling this radioactive dust. But the VA still does not count Palomares as a radiation risk event or provide these veterans with the disability benefits they are entitled to. The failure to recognize the sacrifice of these veterans is a breach of our responsibility to those who serve. My bill would correct this ensuring these veterans get the health care and benefits they deserve, and ensuring that their surviving spouses and children are el eligible for the benefits they deserve. Time is of the essence for these veterans. I urge this committee to expeditiously consider this legislation and get those who served and sacrificed the help they deserve as quickly as possible. I continue to welcome co-sponsors on this bill, HR 2580, and I ask all of my colleagues to join in this effort to support this critical legislation. Thank you, Chairman Takano, for your support on this important legislation and for having me here today and prioritizing toxic exposure legislation during this Congress. We must all work together to prevent these type of incidents for future veterans and provide them with accessible and affordable health care. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Hayes, for recounting uh, this uh, not well-known piece of our history uh, and uh, for your contribution to today's hearing. Uh, so before we move on to the second panel, does anyone have any questions for our first panel? And I will take a moment to pause to make sure that the there's no hands raised. I do not see any hands raised. I do see a hand raised. Uh, uh, Representative Captor, do you have a question? Or Thank you comment? so much, Mr. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members, for your excellent testimony and the hard work it took for each of those bills. I just wanted to say, having served um, on the Veterans Committee going back to the 1980s when we were first facing Agent Orange, and the VA kept saying to us, well, you don't have all the medical proof. And uh, this was over and over and over again. And uh, we had a member from Ohio, Doug Applegate, and I'll never forget his quote. He said, there's a difference between what is scientifically provable and morally right. Uh, subsequent to the passage of legislation creating the first Agent Orange Center in the state of New York, um, the nation went on to learn more about Agent Orange. We were, Congress was ahead of science. And maybe on many of these bills and the measures individuals are bringing forward, which I compliment you for, we should keep that quote in mind. There's a difference between what is scientifically provable today and what is morally right uh, for their service. And I'll just say, I just left an event about a week ago with the direct, with the uh, uh, general uh, who is head of the New York uh, National Guard who grew up in our district and is revered as a Latina and someone who has risen to the highest ranks of our military. And she was in Iraq and she talked to me about burn pits and she has contracted cancers in her life already. So I just, you know, is, is it connected? Uh, we shouldn't wait too long. We should, we should help those who serve and have served. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Kafter. We, we thank you for that uh, institutional history and your service now and your service uh, back when you first came to Congress as the longest serving uh, woman in Congress and also as the, uh, as the most senior member of the Appropriations Committee. We certainly appreciate Friends on Appropriations. Uh, uh, I now would like to call on Dr. Murphy, Representative Murphy. Uh, you have a question? Yes, sir, I'd like to read a statement, if at all possible, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, please proceed. I, uh, thank you. And I want to thank uh, specifically, uh, this is in support of H.R. Uh, 2192, the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. And I want to thank specifically uh, Representative Cartwright. I don't know if he's on the call anymore. Um, and also uh, Representative David Price from North Carolina in support of this. Um, I, I just like to point out, we often hear that struggles that are of our service members, and we've heard them today, um, that the, uh, they and their family members face as part of their service to the United States. Those struggles should never happen due to failure or negligence by the federal government, but they unfortunately did at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, which is in my district from the 1950s through the 1980s. During that time, uh, at the base, thousands of Marines, their families, civilian workers, and other personnel um, uh, were exposed to tap water that was contaminated with harmful chemicals found at levels ranging from two, uh, 240 to 3,400 times the levels permitted by safety standards. These exposures likely increase the risk of cancers. And I don't say that lightly. I'm a physician, and just because one's been exposed to something and developed cancer does not mean that those are causes. But they were disposed, and these exposures likely increase the risks of several cancers kidney cancer, which I deal with, multiple myeloma, leukemia, and several others. They also increase the risk of adverse birth outcomes, as well as other negative health effects. The Janie Ensminger Act, which was passed in 2012, authorized medical care for military family members, military and family members who lived at Camp Lejeune and developed conditions that they thought were tied to the base water contamination. While this legislation was a starting point, more needed to be done to get uh, help to the people who are impacted. That's why I'm asking for support for HR 2192, known as the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. This bill specifically amends the federal judicial code to authorize a new tort claim against the United States, and specifically allows a tort claim for damages related to the injuries or the death of the member of the U.S. Armed Forces uh, and or their family or, or friends, or family rather, and caused by a negligent and wrongful act and arising out of the violation of environmental law at Camp Lejeune from August of 53 to December of 87. We've had uh, 12 separate VSOs sign on. I'm hopeful that in this bipartisan act, which we have uh, folks from both committees, or both parties rather, sign on that other VSOs will sign on in support of this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the time and I'll yield back. Yield back. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, 
uh, thank you for uh, your statement. And uh, of course, I really appreciate that we have you and Dr. Ruiz and uh, on our committee uh, bringing your medical expertise and credibility to the work we do. So thank you. Thank you. Now, before we move on, uh, do I see any, are there any other members who wish to uh, ask a question or make a comment at this time? All right, seeing, seeing none, if not, uh, I now invite our second panel to the witness table. So joining us from the Department of Veterans Affairs is Dr. Ronald Burke, Deputy Undersecretary for Policy and Oversight, Veterans of the Veterans Benefit Administration, accompanied by Beth Murphy, Executive Director for Compensation Service, Ms. Patricia Hastings, Chief Consultant for Post-Deployment Health Services, and Dr. Carl Kelsey, representing the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I appreciate all the work and research the academies have provided uh, on military toxic exposures and scientific methods for determining related health impacts. I look forward to hearing from all of you. I will remind our witnesses to please pause for two to three seconds before speaking so that the recording will capture all of your words. And please remember uh, to do so when answering members' questions. Your written statements in full will be included in the hearing record uh, and without uh, uh, hearing record without objection. Uh, Mr. Burke, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Bost and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today along with my colleagues. In the opening statement of his confirmation hearing, Secretary McDonough made it clear that VA would provide veterans with timely world-class health care and ensure veterans and their families have timely access to their benefits. It is clear by the number of toxic bills uh, before toxic exposure bills before us today that military toxic and environmental exposure is a critical congressional interest item. For decades, veterans and their families have sought answers to questions about health issues and potential connections to service-related toxic exposures. Secretary McDonough is committed to taking immediate and deliberate steps to ensure the department leans forward in its approach to getting answers to key environmental exposure questions. We acknowledge that VA must continuously evaluate how we approach researching and granting claims for disabilities related to toxic and environmental exposures. We recognize that to succeed, the new approach will require the collective efforts of VA, our academic partners, other federal agencies, and Congress. Secretary McDonough has outlined a list of priorities that form the foundation for the work that he has directed the department to undertake. To ensure in-depth analysis of high priority issues, the secretary reestablished the VA executive board consisting of subject matter experts and senior leaders. The VA Executive Board met uh, on March 23rd of this year and received clear guidance to focus on issues related to toxic exposures and providing input to inform solutions. While the Executive Board led review is designed to be holistic, it is not necessary to conduct a review to know that there are some things that we can and must do differently today. Historically, VA's presumptive decision making process has been guided by statutory requirements. However, certain provisions of the Agent Orange Act and Persian Gulf War Veterans Act, notably those governing the use of National Act Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine reports, and requiring the Secretary to respond to such reports in 60 days, have expired. With that expiration, we see an opportunity. VA is creating a new comprehensive modernized decision-making model for determining presumptions based on environmental exposures. Our model includes leveraging improved science and surveillance, better use of VA benefits claims data, and consideration of other factors. We are moving with a sense of urgency and hope to share the proposed model with Congress, BSOs, and other key partners for feedback within, next, within the next 180 days. 
in order to do a better job researching exposure to toxic substance, substances and military environmental hazards, we need more insight into the health issues that veterans are experiencing. Our research indicates that an overly cumbersome process and an assumption of denial discourages veterans from filing toxic and environmental exposure related claims. At the Secretary's direction, we are undertaking efforts to encourage veterans who believe their symptoms are related to toxic exposure to participate in health registries. Part of that effort will, will include encouraging veterans to get a compensation pension exam and to submit a claim to VA if there is a concern about exposure. A new DOD and VA effort that will help in this future is the individual longitudinal exposure record that just went active for clinical care and will be available for claims and research. With one in three veterans reporting a possible exposure to military environmental hazards and one in four veterans reporting health concerns due to deployment exposures, VA must take decisive action. The secretary has directed that we take, new, uh, that we take a new and decisive approach. This holistic approach involves reviewing all major touch points within the agency for a veteran who has experienced toxic exposure, as well as internal agency functions within this area. The review is a review, the review of both claims data functions and VHA data and information as part of this review. While Secretary McDonough's end-to-end -end review is being completed, VA will take the following additional steps. Number one, expand training for healthcare providers. Two, improve science, surveillance, epidemiology, and research. Three, make better use of benefits data and consider other factors. And four, encourage veterans to file a claim. I refer you to the written testimony for additional details regarding these steps. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. My colleagues and I are prepared to respond to any questions you or other members of the committee may have. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Uh, I now uh, turn to uh, Dr. Kelsey uh, and recognize Dr. Kelsey for five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Uh, I appear today as a member of several National Academies committees that assessed the evidence of a relationship between exposures encountered during the military service and adverse health effects. I'll focus on the standards used for weighing and assessing epidemiologic evidence of exposures, exposure to toxins and health effects of those exposures. I'll describe the differences between association and causation and give examples of how those standards were used in the National Academies reports. The criteria for causation are more stringent than those for association and are more difficult to satisfy. Correlation does not equal causation. Observed links or associations can be due to many factors. Causality is more than a link. It is a demonstration that an exposure is responsible for a specific health outcome. Many factors may be considered when deciding whether an observed statistical association is causal. These include the strength of the association, the dose time response relationship, consistency of the evidence through replication and others. But in every case of causality, the exposure comes before the outcome. For every exposure outcome relationship, there will be grad gradations of evidence and certainty, chance confounding and bias related to errors in selection and measurement or factors can hide or create the appearance of causation or association. The National Academy's study committees carefully consider these factors. There have been numerous studies, uh, health studies of veterans, but most have been hampered by the lacking or weak measures of exposure and by other methodologic problems. For example, no objective measurements of exposure to herbicides are available for most Vietnam veterans. Instead, and in accord with Congress's mandated presumption of herbicide exposure of all Vietnam veterans, National Academies committees have used Vietnam veteran status as a proxy for herbicide or Agent Orange exposure when no more specific exposure information is available. Similarly, research regarding exposure to open burn pits has been impeded by relatively poor measures of exposure. As a result, it's not possible to determine quantitative estimates of increased risks or to estimate the number of service members and veterans affected. When reliable and accurate exposure information is not available for military populations, deployment to a particular area is used as a proxy for exposure. 
that maybe is general as a particular country or region such as the Southwest Asia theater. Causal models and inference are dependent on high quality data. Poor exposure assessment and use of such proxies as deployed or non-deployed limit the ability to inform causality. The evidence assessed to determine causality is continuing continuing to evolve. And in recent years, causality determination has become much more complex as new methods evolve, technologies advance, and we learn more about how factors such as genetics, stress, and the social determinants of health influence overall well-being. The Agent Orange Act tasked the National Academy's studies committees with evaluating evidence and drawing conclusions that are based on statistical association, not on causality when assessing the health effects of herbicide exposure. The four categories that we have used are sufficient, limited or suggestive, inadequate or insufficient, and no association. The default category for any health outcome is inadequate or insufficient until enough evidence is accumulated to reclassify it into a different category. The classifications of health outcomes are based on the study committee's evaluation of the epidemiologic literature and evidence of biological plausibility or mechanistic data. They reflect a committee's judgment of the relative certainty of the association between the outcome and the exposure to herbicides used in Vietnam. The category descriptions reflect variations in the completeness and the quality of the evidence and the degree of certainty about an association or lack of evidence of an association. Similarly, the National Academies committees that authored the Gulf War and Health series applied similar categorical framework, but included a fifth category of sufficient evidence of a causal relationship as they were not constrained by law to classify the outcomes solely by association. This approach was developed to be flexible enough to be applicable to a range of various exposures and incorporate epidemiologic, toxicologic, and mechanistic data. Without information on the extent of exposure among veterans and quantitative information about the dose time response relationship for each health outcome in humans, estimation of the risks experienced by veterans exposed to specific hazards is not possible. Although the record keeping has improved and exposure estimation has been incrementally better on the whole, there are still few instances when it makes sense to use causality standards to assess the effects of military exposures. As a result, for the near future, the nature of the data that exists and are available will usually allow National Academies committees to classify association between exposure and health effects on the basis of association rather than causation. I appreciate the opportunity to testify here today, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Kelsey. We're, we are very honored and pleased to have you here. Um, uh, I will uh, now recognize myself for five minutes uh, for questioning. Uh, my first question is to uh, Mr. Burke. Uh, I just want to say that the VA's lack of direct views and testimony on the bills we have before us is concerning. The goals of this committee and VA should be the same, uh, to quickly provide the necessary care and benefits that veterans have earned. And the best and only way to accomplish this is if we work together. So Mr. Burke, what assurances can you provide uh, to this committee uh, that VA will indeed work collaboratively with Congress to provide the necessary reforms to the toxic exposure claims process as VA completes the end-to-end -end review described in your testimony. So Mr. Chairman, my responses today are not designed to frustrate or disappoint uh, the committee, but rather to impress upon the committee, the secretary's commitment to make this his top priority issue. Um, we have worked for years collaboratively. We will continue to work collaborative, collaboratively. That is an expectation of the secretary. That is the direction of the secretary. Uh, and at this point, uh, allowing the secretary to build his framework for a new and improved way to address toxic exposures uh, is uh, is what we're here to convey today. So I appreciate the committee's uh, interest in this level. I can assure you that it is a, a top priority for the, for the secretary uh, and, uh, and you have our commitment, our continued commitment to collaborate uh, with this committee as well as other members of Congress. Well, thank you for that, Burke. I, I uh, certainly hope that we can work together collaboratively. Uh, I want to turn to another question. Congress took action to provide benefits to Vietnam veterans suffering from bladder cancer, hyperthyroidism, and Parkinsonism last Congress due to a lack of response on VA's part 
to respond to the recommendations in the 2016 National Academy's report on veterans and Agent Orange. Why should we trust that VA will unilaterally act in a timely fashion to address other toxic exposure scenarios? Again, sir, thank you for that question. Uh, I can assure you that the importance of this topic is not lost on the secretary. Uh, in fact, by means of standing up the VA executive board, making his first meeting uh, critically clear that this is an important uh, topic, uh, I can assure you that the department is committed um, to not only working with Congress, but to addressing this in a more holistic, faster, more accurate approach that is, uh, uh, that is desperately needed. So you have our commitment. The secretary has made that very clear. That is one of his marching orders, and therefore we are committed to, to doing just that. Well, thank you. Can you let us know the status of the implementation of the three new Agent Orange presumptive disabilities? Uh, sir, at this time, I can tell you that there is a uh, procedural memo uh, going through concurrence. Uh, we hope to have that uh, finalized here in the very near future. Uh, and I will uh, defer to my colleague, um, the Executive Director of Compensation Service, Ms. Beth Murphy, for any additional detail. Uh, yes, Mr. Burke, that's correct. We have a policy letter that would lay out um, interim procedures so that our uh, 56 regional offices can begin processing these claims. Um, uh, normally, it's about an 18 to 24 month rulemaking process. Uh, we know that that uh, takes longer than we want or our veterans or members of Congress want before we start paying these claims. So we've leaned in at the secretary's direction and that uh, document is uh, near the end of the concurrence process is my understanding. So uh, we're, we're talking a, a, a few months rather than uh, a couple of years, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kelsey, uh, the committee is looking to streamline VA's decision-making process for determining their relationship between exposures and service and various illnesses. Can you quickly explain the recommended framework the National Academies outlined in its 2008 report on improving the presumptive disability decision-making process? Uh, sure, Mr. Chairman. The, the 2008 committee um, was really uh, charged with the purpose of assessing the process which is, uh, includes, uh, as I think you can appreciate, uh, a lot of um, additional uh, factors, not the least of which is uh, uh, political, which I assume everyone here is much more in touch with than I am. But the, the, the political and uh, social aspects of the rulemaking were included in their assessment. They um, proposed different categories for describing the likelihood of causal relationship. They proposed uh, sufficient, equipoise and above, below equipoise and against. And those uh, categories can be, I think, uh, explained succinctly, if you'd like. They're, they're sufficient in saying that the evidence is sufficient to conclude a causal relationship exists. Equipoise and above uh, posits that the evidence is sufficient to conclude that a causal relationship is at least as likely as not, but uh, sufficient evidence to conclude that a causal relationship exists is not there. Below is uh, similarly evidence is not sufficient to conclude that a causal relationship is at least as likely or not. And against uh, evidence suggests a lack of a causal relationship. Um, Dr. Kelsey, I'm gonna have to stop sure. you there. I, I was unfair for me to ask you a question that had such a substantive response. I will have to hope that some other members will, will pick up on that topic. Um, sure. I, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I, I do want to call on the ranking member Bost uh, for uh, his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Burke, the first question I need to ask is from you, and, and that is, does the VA support HR 2127, the Team Act? Why or why not? Sir, thank you for that question. I appreciate your interest in this matter. Uh, as you are aware, VA has taken a singular position with all 15 of these bills. Uh, uh, and the perspective is, and the position is that we've got to allow the secretary to roll out his new framework. Uh, it is imperative in this very complex issue that we allow the secretary to roll out his vision, his plan, his directive. Uh, and, uh, and so no individual views on the bill specifically. 
but just a reiteration that the secretary has made toxic exposure a number one priority uh, right. and that is our position today, sir. Then, then let me put it this way because i have a tremendous amount of respect for your team and i have a tremendous amount of respect for the secretary the T team act is supported by 30 organizations who believe this bill can be helpful to veterans critical care and benefits through the va and the veteran the veterans need help right now right now and we need to move forward with all of these proposals to try to work together and you need to also remember that the secretary can have his policies and we can work with him but we write the law we write the law and then we understand where we're coming from and why it is we need to respond now and i believe that the va needs to move forward to give comments on all of our bills so that we can try to work together to achieve what is best and as quickly as we can for our veterans we've drug our feet long enough uh whatever his position will be and your position will then be is fine but remember it is us through this house and then through the senate and then signed by the president what laws will be in place and what you will be doing that being said i need to ask um uh miss hastings if i can if toxic exposure veterans were allowed to enroll in priority group six like the team act would allow how many additional enrollees and active users of the va healthcare system would the va expect and how would that impact the veterans health administration budget staff and uh infrastructure needs Ranking Member Boss, that's a very complicated question, as I'm, I'm sure you know, and I will take that for record and we will get you a response. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Mr. Kelsey, a VA testimony, your VA testimony stated that uh, Secretary uh, McDonald has directed the department to consider evidence concerning animal tox uh, toxicology and uh, mechanic mechanistic studies, right? Does does the NAS uh, consider those studies when completing the report on the health effects of military toxin exposures such, such as Agent Orange? Uh, ranking member, uh, absolutely. The committee's process is uh, explicit and does include, uh, including a search for, uh, and they include uh, in their assessment, uh, the toxicologic and mechanistic studies, absolutely. Yes. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Burke, I got, I got, and I, I think that probably the answer came a while ago, and you'll probably have to get back with me on this. Would, I would like to, if you could, come back, uh, if you don't know the answer right now, what the VA estimates are on the Team Act and the cost uh, that it would affect over the next one year, five years, and 10 years if, if it was implemented. So I'm, I'm sure you can't do that right now. But as soon as you could, I'd appreciate to get that information back to us as well. Um, so also, though, on today's agenda, um, I know that several, a lot of these things have a high price tag. The total in some cases is tens of billions of dollars in mandatory money and, and would require an offset to comply with the pay-go rules. What offset would the administration support to try to pay for some of these things that we're looking forward to, to try to move forward? Sir, thank you for that question. That, that is one certainly I'll take back for the record and, and, and get back to you in the committee on, sir. Okay. With my time's running short with that, Mr. Chairman, and I will yield back. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Bost. Uh, I, I'm going to call on um, Representative Slotkin, uh, the chairwoman of DAMA, uh, of the DAMA subcommittee, Representative Luria, um, has agreed to swap places in the, uh, the question order uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, permit that to occur uh, uh, in, in, in deference to the fact that Ms. Slotkin has to uh, do her question earlier. So Representative Slotkin, you're recognized for five minutes for questioning. Thank you, uh, Chairman Takano, and thank you, Congresswoman Luria, for swapping with me. I owe you one. Um, I, I guess the question I have is related to burn pits, and, and Mr. Burke, you know, I, I appreciate um, your discussion of Agent Orange. I appreciate that in your written testimony, you talked about this issue of concession. Um, and we know that on Agent Orange, um, that it took 29 years to get the first big landmark piece of legislation. And then if you served in the Blue Water Navy and were exposed, it took 
57 years for the VA to concede that there was exposure and that might lead to, to major health ailments. So can you discuss the framework around concession? How would it work? How does it work? How could it work um, for, uh, you know, you, you at least conceded that folks in Southwest Asia, so Afghanistan and that theater were exposed. Talk about the framework. How does it work um, so that we're not waiting another 29 or 57 years? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that uh, for that question. And thank you for the opportunity to ex explain that. And you are correct. We are uh, accepting. We are encouraging veterans to file claims. We are accepting those claims and considering those on a direct basis instead of presumption at this moment. Uh, we've given procedural guidance to our claims processors that if the facts and circumstances of the claim show that the veteran served in a location where burn pits were used, we acknowledge or concede uh, that the burn pit, but we ex we can see the burn pit exposure and then consider the claims on a direct basis. Uh, I should point out that post 9-11 veterans, uh, two thirds of those veterans had filed claims with us. Um, and so again, uh, if the facts and circumstances reveal that the veteran was an area where there was known burn pits, we can see the exposure. And I'm hoping, ma'am, that that answers your, your yeah, question. Yeah, and that, you know, certainly uh, I'm biased here because the bill that I'm suggesting lists the countries for exposure. I would note that in the post 9-11 era, there are a whole bunch of countries, but I wouldn't leave out, for instance, Somalia um, before 9-11, a few other places where I have you know, constituents who have watched their platoon leaders die from exposure. Um, so what guidance have you given the VA today before we have laws, before we have this toxic and exposure legislation, what guidance has Secretary McDonough given today to folks on the front lines in our VA centers on the issue of exposure to burn pits? Uh, Ma'am, so the Secretary has made it very clear, and I'm here today to actually emphasize, it is important, it is imperative that we encourage veterans to file claims. We are continuing to consider these claims on a direct basis. And the filing of claims also allows us to do one of the four pillars of what the secretary expects, and that is to collect data. And so we need the data from the, the filing of claims to fit into the framework. So again, if there's a veteran out there that is watching today's uh, uh, hearing or is in contact with, with you or your office, uh, we would encourage them, please file the claim. They will be considered now. They are being considered on a direct basis. And the data collection, again, is one of the four pillars of the charge that the secretary has given the VA, and we're doing that currently. Okay, but I, so there's been some sort of form. Of, I mean, I guess the, the point is, we know that our veterans have felt dissuaded. They have felt like it's not worth the time, especially if they're sick to go through that claims process because it hasn't been fruitful in the past. So what sick person would ever take the time to fight the, the red tape of the system if they knew it wasn't gonna lead to much? So has there been official documentation memos, something that the secretary has sent out so that people on the front lines are not just waiting for someone to just realize that they can now file a claim, but they're actively marketing that to the veterans? Man, that's a great, uh, great question, great perspective. And what I can tell you is through the secretary's testimony, through my testimony now twice, um, we have committed to getting the word out, encouraging veterans to file. And VA will be increasing its communication to stakeholders, BSOs, uh, and the like to get the message out. If you have uh, a claim that you believe is a result of exposure to toxins, please file your claim. Yeah, uh, and, it, and I would just say in my remaining time that, you know, in my very short time on the committee, there's so many good things that we have to offer veterans and so little communication to the veterans on what they're eligible for. So I think just expect that sort of the final mile from certainly myself and I think the rest of the committee to push through and make sure we know not just what you're doing to change policy, but the outreach plan to communicate that to the veterans. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Chairman and Congresswoman Luria. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Slotkin. Uh, I now uh, call on uh, Mr. Mervan for three, uh, four or five minutes. Mr. Mervan. Thank you, Chairman. And I appreciate the opportunity to address uh, this uh, distinct panel. And when we speak to uh, 
this issue, my question for Mr. Burke is, uh, obviously the stance that you have is against what uh, the current um, thought process is, is protecting and advancing veteran issues. That being said, what in conjunction going forward can be done to work with the VA to make sure uh, that the understanding of the passing of the law and the uh, VA centered issues are at point when it comes to the, uh, the burn and toxic burns. Sir, thank you for your question. I can assure you that uh, VA has uh, immense focus uh, on this particular topic. And we've worked, uh, as has been alluded uh, in, in, in earlier comments during the hearing today, uh, many of these bills have been worked in collaboration with, with uh, stakeholders, including us, and we will continue to collaborate with members of Congress and this committee uh, moving forward. But I want to be able to stress the importance that this is not a delay tactic. This is the Secretary's approach to doing a new revamped holistic review so that we don't wait the years that we've referenced in the hearing for, uh, for relief for, uh, for veterans. And part of his approach is to leverage not only existing partnerships, um, but to looking to forge new ones. So the collaboration, not only with Congress, but with other stakeholders, is again a key component of what the Secretary expects and what the Secretary has demanded. And my follow-up is with the passion that our bipartisan committee has on this issue, just redefine how it could be delayed or not taken action uh, immediately upon what we have talked about. Sir, I think the, the, the main thing to point out here is that this is an extremely complex issue. And that's evidenced by just the 15 bills that we're looking at today. This is not a singular, simple issue to solve. But the Secretary's most important comment to us as an organization is that he has to get this right. Um, and so giving the Secretary an opportunity, leveraging the VA Executive Board, the new principles that he's put in place, it is not one that will get done overnight. However, the Secretary has said it is time to act now. Uh, giving the Secretary the opportunity to collaborate, pull together the framework, uh, and, and, and implement a model that actually uh, embodies our eye care values. He's very serious about committing to this. Uh, he wants us to be advocates for veterans. Um, and, and, and those eye care values are the things that he's asking us to build along with this new framework. So there is no, no interest in, in taking longer than necessary, but this is very complex. There are a lot of moving pieces and the secretary wants to get it right. As does as, Congress, as does Congress, sir. Yes, um, and then my final question would be um, ultimately by getting it right um, and uh, the secretary's philosophy in theoretically examining things and putting his best foot forward, time expires. Um, and as you mentioned, um, getting it right means veterans who are suffering uh, and not getting benefits for their exposures are at risk. So I urge uh, the secretary and urge the VA uh, to act accordingly uh, in protecting our veterans. Yes, sir. And I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you, Representative from Ravan. Uh, I would now uh, call on uh, Representative Sablon for five minutes. Yeah, um, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome the witnesses and thank them for their testimonies today. Um, Mr. Burke, um, Secretary Burke, a much of the testimony today from the VA source starts on the difficulty of catching potential toxic, toxic exposure as early as possible. The individual Longitudinal Exposure Record, ILER, is the DOD VA joint effort to establish a record of service-related toxic exposure. ILER exists as a web-based application and is intended to improve efficiency, effectiveness, and quality of healthcare. The most recent information on the VA website indicates ILER was to be delivered as a pilot program in fall of 2019. So would you kindly explain to me what the current status of ILER is? 
East. Yes, sir. Thank you for the status on ILER. I'm going to refer to Dr. Hastings from BHA, who's a member member of this panel as well. So, Dr. Hastings. Is that yes, Dr. Hastings who was formerly in Hawaii? Yes, I was formerly in Hawaii, and I I miss it every day. Um, but that was when I was um, in the Army, and uh, now I am at the VA and very happy to be serving here. But I am very pleased to tell you, sir, that Eiler is in the field. It is being used. We can make copies for the veterans if, uh, if they need a copy through the Joint Legacy Viewer at this time. I know that there is the desire to have veterans have direct access to it. There are some security issues that will need to be worked out. Um, and that will have to be de um, developed as part of the IT package, but it is available now clinically. We do have at least one person at a each VA medical center that has an Eiler account. Clinicians can also reach it without an account through the joint legacy viewer. Um, the portion for uh, claims is available and we are working on the research capability at this time, but very pleased to tell you that it is working and the feedback we've gotten so far is that it is very appreciated and uh, very helpful. Uh, yeah, I, I, hope, I hope it continues to be built that way, but uh, as a follow-up, um, could either um, be used as an existing data collection system to address the, the inequities to ensure all veterans uh, get connected to care early before illness progresses. It is one of those things that can help a clinician start the conversation with a veteran when they come in because they can look at the places where they have been deployed. We do have excellent education for our clinicians that is available online um, as an e-learning. It actually is also available on a platform that civilian physicians can use um, that will allow them to get, in fact, free continuing medical education credits. Um, and it's very well done. So um, yes, um, Eiler does let them see where the person has been, where the veteran has served, and also will give them information as to what exposures may have been there. Uh, and it can help start the conversation with their veteran. So yeah, uh, like, you know, I know the VA does so many good things uh, for our veterans, but there are also issues that occur. Uh, I hope this Eiler uh, uh, continues to be a useful uh, tool for both the providers and for our veterans. So Chairman Takano, uh, um, my, I yield my time back. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Sablon. Uh, we now have uh, Representative Miller Meeks um, on camera and M uh, Representative Miller Meeks, uh, you recognize for five minutes questioning. Thank you, uh, Chair Takano, um, Ranking Member Boston, all of our witnesses today. Um, my question comes uh, from uh, a great deal of empathy for both our veterans as a 24 year military veteran in the healthcare sector um, as a doctor and a former director of public health. So I know very well the uh, difficulties and challenges of association versus causation. Um, Dr. Uh, Kelsey, studies have shown the harmful effects of breathing in fumes from open air burning. Uh, however, um, in uh, the uh, National Academy of Sciences September 2020 report on the health effects of airborne hazard uh, exposure uh, in a has only found limited or suggested evidence of an and explained why NAS was unable to link specific disabilities uh, with service in uh, Southwest Asia theater of operation. Uh, representative, if I heard you correctly, um, uh, I, I first I wasn't a member of that committee, but I have served on numerous other committees where similar assessments uh, were conducted. And I would say in, in that instance, the real issue is not all that different from what I said in the opening remark, which is really around uh, quantification of exposure. In an effort to really understand the, I mean, as I'm sure you can appreciate the dose 
response relationship, it does require uh, quantifying exposure. And with respect to burn pits, that's a really a very uh, high, uh, difficult task. The, the real problem I think that the committee had was assessing individual exposure. And given that that's almost impossible to do, it's, uh, it's also uh, then it follows difficult to go beyond limited and suggestive evidence. I think the committee certainly uh, uh, given better exposure data could likely do a better job than they did. But I think they're in their, in, in their um, as, assessment, they were hamstrung by what many of the other committees, the Agent Orange committees and other committees, the Gulf War committees have been hamstrung by, which is really the, uh, the poor quality of the exposure data. Ms. Melvick's with us. I think Ms. Miller Meeks, uh, Dr. Miller Meeks has, uh, uh, is, is she back with us now? There she is. Yes. I apologize, sorry about that. Um, development of symptoms and the timeliness of exposure. Dr. Milwix, could you repeat your question? Um, uh, you, yes, sir, you, I apologize. You, you faded out, but re, can you repeat your question? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize. Uh, is there also a difficulty with uh, the uh, time period when symptoms are developed and the exposure or the lag of development of symptoms? Uh, right, absolutely. That's uh, certainly a, a, an additional complication. The 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 timing is uh, a, absolutely important here, and uh, keeping track of that is uh, presents similar difficulty. So I completely agree. And then, if I have remaining time, Mr. Chair, um, if the VA and the scientific uh, community implemented the recommendations in the September 2020 uh, report, and I realize that you were. Uh, uh, had limited uh, uh, development, would the VA be in a, a better position, or we in Congress be in a better position to understand the health effects of burn pits and the airborne um, hazard exposure? Um, if that's for me, uh, I'm a, a less familiar with the, the uh, legislation, so I, I, I best not comment on specifics there, except to say that the uh, in any improvement in uh, exposure assessment, be it uh, when the symptoms occur, when exposure occurs, the time dose, all of these things are important. And so any uh, improvements that can be uh, legislated are certainly uh, go a long way towards uh, 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 enhancing our understanding of the situation. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Kelsey, and uh, thank you, Chair Takano. I yield my time. Thank you, Dr. Miller Meeks. And we also appreciate your medical expertise um, informing the community, uh, the, informing uh, the committee's work. Uh, the chairwoman of our Dama subcommittee, uh, Representative Luria, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Takano, and, and thank you to our witnesses today. Um, I wanted to start, uh, Mr. Burke, by asking you uh, a question about your testimony that you submitted both to the House and Senate, you indicated that the VA would first like the opportunity to improve its internal approach to toxic exposures um, and needs additional time to do so. I, I was just curious, what current authorities does the agency have to act on its own to correct these problems? And um, what, if any, support do you need from Congress in order to accomplish this? Yes, ma'am, thank you for your question. Um, in, in, in a couple of things, the, the secretary, again, has made it very clear that he wants to do an end-to-end -end review, not just of what we're doing internally, but our partnerships. He wants to leverage not only the partners that we've had historically, but new partners, um, Congress, of course, being included. Um, and for now, while the secretary does his end-to-end -end review, again, I think what we have authority to do now and we are doing is to accept and process claims on a direct basis. Um, and we are accepting those claims. So while the secretary does his improvements or lays out the framework for his improvements, um, you know, we are we are continuing to focus on encouraging veterans to file claims, uh, adjudicating those claims on a direct basis, uh, and we have and we have been doing so. Uh, in the meantime, the secretary is is working feverishly to stand up the new framework. 
uh, and I'm sure collaboration with Congress with Congress will be a key component of, of moving forward. Thank you. And you indicated needing uh, 180 days to complete the review. How quickly after the review is completed can we anticipate seeing action to presume the, uh, to improve the presumptive process that we've been discussing today? Um, that I don't know, ma'am, uh, but I will assure you that the secretary has zero interest in delay. Um, we were we were given the 100 day 180 day framework. I know that the secretary has committed to uh, updating Congress in, in other forums and other topics as this is one of his top priorities. I would imagine that would be the same. Well, thank you. And, and Mr. Burke, the Covenant Act, which is my legislation, as well as some of my colleagues' legislation that we also discussed today, included extending Priority Group 6 uh, Veterans Health Administration access um, to its covered veterans dating back to 1990. Um, at this time, is the VA confident in, in its ability to, to welcome an increased number of veterans if we were to expand access to that care? Um, and if not, are there additional resources that would be required from Congress in order to expand care to that larger group of veterans? Uh, Ma'am, if it's fine with you, I'd like to take that one back, uh, consult with VHA and come back with a response. Okay, uh, well, thank you. And um, Ms. Murphy, I would love to, to switch gears a little bit and, and talk about compensation and pension exams, uh, which we've had an opportunity to, to talk about in our subcommittee um, before. Um, and one of the things I'm concerned about is consistency and training for VA and contract examiners um, uh, in a variety of areas. And do you feel like there's a current continuity um, in training and performance of these exams across both um, uh, the, the VA and contract examiners um, relative to toxic exposure issues? Chair Luria, I know that we have had um, good rigorous discussion about this uh, under your leadership on the Dhamma Sam Committee. And yes, I, I, uh, I'm uh, assured that there is the, the same training that VHA has is also used for our contract examiners. Uh, it's continually refreshed. Um, we have uh, actually split off the uh, medical disability examination office from compensation service just this fiscal year into its own standalone office. So it could have um, you know, a, a dedicated oh, I'm executive. I'm sorry, Ms. Murphy, your audio is, is going in and out. It's very difficult. Um, to to hear you, I you know I just um, you know I, I did ask about both the VA and contract examiners, and and I believe that you um, you started to answer with a comparison between the two and, and answering that yes. there is consistency. But yes, is it? I guess maybe my question should be more so: Is it sufficient? Um, is the process sufficient? And are the examiners adequately trained when seventy eight percent of these toxic exposure related claims um, are being rejected? So yes, ma'am, they are adequately trained and consistently trained. And uh, the, the report that you challenged us to expand that burn pit report that only narrowly reports on uh, a small subset, the 14,000 where actually burn pit shows up um, in the uh, on search words in the claim. Uh, we're in the process of expanding that report. Uh, we're on target to uh, publish the expanded report beginning next month. And that will show not just the 14,000 that very narrowly have burn pit um, exposure in their file, but the broader um, 2.5 million uh, post 9-11 uh, deployed folks, uh, for example, um, two thirds of whom have claimed, um, two thirds uh, of whom have claimed, uh, uh, filed a claim and 62% um, of who are service connected and um, the grant rate on those is 94%. And I do apologize for my audio, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Well, we were able to hear you at the end and okay. I um, am very much anticipating um, seeing the results of, of this report and working with you um, to ensure that the most number of veterans possible um, receive um, healthcare uh, for, uh, conditions related to their service. And so thank you for your work on behalf of the veterans and, and look forward to continuing our work together for this issue. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Chair Luria. Uh, I now uh, recognize uh, Dr. Ruiz, represent Dr. Ruiz for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Takano, and thank you to all of the witnesses here today. 
I want to take this down to the basics. Uh, my first question is to Mr. Burke. Uh, Mr. Burke, would you consistently burn trash, including plastics, human waste, possibly even jet fuel in your backyard or near your family? I would not, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kelsey. Doctor to doctor, uh, what potential illnesses could a healthy person develop if they consistently burn trash, as I mentioned, in their backyard? Uh, Dr. Ruiz, uh, that's a, a complicated question, but there's a panel. It's not very complicated. You know the answer. People will what, get what are the illnesses that can potentially be uh, they can develop from breathing in the smoke from burning trash in their backyard? Well, it depends on the exposure. Certainly respiratory illness is uh, uh, commonly encountered by uh, uh, inhalation of, of uh, you know, things that burn. Uh, right. What else? What other? So respiratory illnesses, what else? Depending upon what you're burning, you could uh, you can get systemic illness of all sorts. Uh, you, there's immunotoxic agents that you can inhale. There's uh, you can have digestive ailments. There's a there's, how about carcinogens? Uh, of course, absolutely. Okay, so then asthma, constrictive bronchiolitis, COPD, potential leukemias, pancreatic cancer, brain cancers. All these are potential health consequences of burning trash in your backyard and with the, the exposures uh, and dosage, of course, Dr. Kelsey, that you had mentioned. So burning household waste produces many toxic chemicals and is one of the largest known sources of dioxins in the nation. Dioxin is a carcinogen. A carcinogen causes cancer. Cancer causes deaths, right? It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty straightforward association. In fact, According to the EPA, burning waste is a serious public health threat. The EPA banned it in the U.S. in 1979. It is bad for people here. It is bad for our military personnel serving our countries overseas. We need to end the exposure to burn pits in our military, and we need to act now to care for our veterans who are coming back with delayed injuries in the form of asthma, constrictive bronchiolitis, COPD, and cancers. Too many have been told by the VA that their injuries are not service related, even though there is enough suspicion, enough evidence to show a high enough association correlation of the illness due to exposure to toxic chemicals from burn pits. We will not, we cannot sit by and watch our veterans wait decades like they were forced to with Agent Orange, which is why I will not stop fighting. We should not stop fighting until our veterans get presumption of service connection for their exposure to toxic substances during their service. Look, you have mentioned, Dr. Kelsey, that producing causality of an agent to an illness is very tough standards. Of course, they're tough standards. The best ideal way of benchmark research is to put a, a person and expose them to the agent, right? And then you can control the amount of dose that they get. Well, that's illegal because it's unethical. And you said it yourself that it is Im almost impossible to determine. So let's not use that as the strict criteria. We need to expand our models of association and correlation to show a high enough suspicion of an agent that causes a se severe enough consequence, which is death. We have already correlation studies from firefighters exposed to the toxic smoke of jet fuels crashing into uh, the buildings that caused cancers and respiratory illnesses. We already have dioxin that has been found in the sample and the sand uh, in places where burn pits were used. And we have bronchoscopic biopsy samples that show metals in the lungs of veterans exposed to burn pits. So there is evidence to show a high enough suspicion, association, correlation to know that our burn pits exposed veterans are dying of cancers, being permanently disabled of respiratory illnesses. This question, last question, is for Mr. Burke. Does the VA support establishing presumption of service connections to veterans exposed to burn pits or other toxic substances? So as contained in the written testimony, my oral statement, the secretary is committing to doing an end-to-end -end review of the current process. All right, so uh, it, it sounds, like, it sounds right. like we're going to have to do it for you. 
uh, it sounds like this committee is going to have to write the legislation and do it for you because we can't wait for a repeat VA uh, performance the way they did in the, for the veterans exposed to Agent Orange. We will not allow that to happen to our veterans in this generation. I yield back my time. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz. I now call on uh, Representative Rosendale, uh, who is the ranking member of our Tech Modernization Subcommittee. Representative Rosendale. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I've been juggling between two, two committees. So if anything I uh, request here is, is replication, I, I apologize right up front. Um, I'd like to start off with Dr. Hastings. Could you please detail the VA's ongoing research into the potential health effects of deployment to K2 Air Base? Absolutely. As you know, we are working with the Agency for Toxic Substance Disease Registry and with DOD very closely. Uh, we do have the interagency agreement completed with the Agency for Toxic Substance Disease Registry, and we are sharing information with DOD for their own mortality study because we have two separate studies, as you know. Um, we have a unique approach with the K2 group um, with ATSDR. It is not going to be a one and done. It is going to be an ongoing surveillance, which will go at least 20 years into the future and possibly longer, sir. Okay, um, and going on, Dr. Hastings, is every veteran patient who seeks care in the VA healthcare system asked about potential toxic exposures? And if, why or why not? I do not know if every single person is asked that, but it is a, an important component of a history. And um, veterans, um, come to VA because VA is uniquely situated to know about what they've been exposed to, what they've, what they've um, had happened to them during their service. And this may be an injury, it may be post-traumatic stress, it may be many other things um, that VA is frankly better at than just about anyone else. So I do not know that every single person is asked that, but I believe that it would be uh, part and parcel of a history done by a VA physician, nurse practitioner, or PA. And we do have an environmental health uh, coordinator at each VA medical center to help the veterans to get in for a specific exam for an exposure assessment or a registry exam. So do we have um, in the, in the uh, record system, the ability to identify immediately where a veteran has been conducting their service so that and have those areas already targeted where they may have been exposed so that we can sort of flag it on their file? Sir, um, we do have service cohorts and we do have some identifiers, but what is coming now is ILER which will do exactly that. We will know where they were, and that will be if it's a garrison exposure, such as our concerns with the Camp Lejeunes, the, um, the PFOS and other things, but it's also their deployments to war zones, to other deployments in Sub-Saharan Africa, Somalia, the Philippines, whatever. Um, but that will let us know exactly where they have been, what years, and uh, we do have an application um, that I will be very happy to send information about called Exposure Ed, which was put together by VA's toxicologist that can let veterans or care providers or civilian physicians, it can be on an iPhone or an Android, and it lets them look at a specific time period. It looks, lets them look at a specific exposure or a specific cohort um, to give them up-to-date information on exposures. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Hastings. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Burke, how would the working group that would be established under HR 2607, the Faster Presumptions Act, differ from the VA's existing working group that assesses newly released NAS reports? Sir, thank you for the question. While I can't specifically comment on the bill you're referencing, the new framework from the VA not only uses existing uh, partnerships, but leverages those of, uh, of new partners. And so the use of NASM findings that we use now would, would continue, but he wants us to look um, 
at uh, the entire wider body of evidence. So without speaking specifically to the bill that you referenced, uh, it will include uh, what we what we utilize now, but expand that body of evidence. And I hope that answers your question, sir. Sure, sure, that is. Thank you. And uh, before I yield back, uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to thank Dr. Ruiz for his passionate uh, remarks and about making sure that we identify this list right now and not let this go on so that we can start providing the benefits to our veterans that they, they have certainly earned and deserve. I appreciate your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Rosendale. Uh, I now uh, recognize uh, the chair of our health subcommittee, uh, Representative Brownlee, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Um, Secretary Burke, uh, as you know, women are, make up close to 20% of the armed forces uh, today, the largest growing cohort within the veteran community. We also know that uh, women veterans experience a higher rate of breast cancer at a younger age than non uh, non veteran women. We also know that other conditions like autoimmune diseases manifest differently in women. So my question is, uh, do you know whether um, the VA or the DA, uh, DOD have conducted any evidence based research on how toxic exposure uh, relates to the prevalence of manifestations of certain health conditions in women specifically. Ma'am, thank you for that question. Let me assure you that uh, women veterans issues are also extremely important to the department. Uh, I'm gonna refer your question to Dr. Hastings uh, to see if there's anything from the health administration side that she'll be able to share with you uh, as far as the, the research and findings. Yes, ma'am. Um, specifically, there are a number of studies that have been done looking at women because the women's issues are, are different in many cases, as you have pointed out. And being a veteran from the military of over 30 years, um, it also is important to me. Um, I am happy to get you a bibliography of some of the major contributions, some of which have come from my office. Uh, thank you for that. And I just hope that we um, have enough of this of these kinds of studies to be um, equivalent, if you will, because women are going to experience um, similar uh, diseases that men will experience from exposure, but also they'll have different manifestations. So um, I just am always fighting for that sort of parity, and particularly when it comes to research. Absolutely. And one of the things I would like to point out is the epidemiology program in this office does oversample women in many cases to make sure that we don't miss something because um, in some cases the, the smaller numbers in previous conflicts. So we do make sure that we make arrangements for that. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Kelsey, um, there's been a lot of conversation obviously over uh, the challenges over association and causation and you have said repeatedly that the problem is poor quality of, of exposure data. So if we were sitting down right in this moment to write legislation um, or to do a rulemaking within the VA, what would you tell us to, to put down to improve quality of, it, of exposure? Uh, a great uh, question and uh, you know, I will re I will tell you that, that when I first served on National Academies committees, I was uh, impressed with the lack of communication between the VA and the DOD. I think that has changed, uh, and I'm all for that. I think the committees have been very frustrated by that. The recent Academies uh, reports have suggested specific things about the flow of information, and there are recommendations in some of these reports uh, that are specific to the, the flow of exposure-related information information and uh, uh, I can read them to you or, or, or get them to you if you'd like, but I think the, the idea is to enhance the free flow of information that around exposure between the DOD and the VA. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I find that um, answer probably a good one, but a challenging one for us to conquer because still the silos, I believe, the silos between uh, DOD and the VA still um, exist and, and 
prevent or provide barriers uh, for solutions to a, to a lot of different problems. And I think, you know, the communication between DOD and VA um, is, is also important on some of these other exposures that we're talking about other than burn pits. So that if we get, if the VA gets any inclination of potential uh, toxic exposure, that should be communicated to the DOD. So the DOD starts to uh, put into practice prevention um, uh, so that, you know, they're never prevented to those, uh, to those toxic substances, which I think is definitely within the realm of possibility and, and can be done. So I think there is a, a lot more um, that needs to be done on that. And I see that my time is coming to an end. I have a lot more questions, but I will end there and I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair Brownlee. And of course, you can always submit your questions uh, in writing uh, for our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Lamb was next, but he has graciously agreed to swap places with Mr. Gallego, who's pressed for time. Mr. Gallego, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. And, uh, you know, just from a perspective of someone who, you know, not just a member of Congress, but I actually am in this community, I was exposed to a burn pit for probably many, many months. Um, and just to your perspective of what, you know, some of us uh, veterans feel, you know, I feel like I'm a ticking time bomb. Every time I go to the doctor for my annual checkup, I'm afraid they're going to find something. I know my friends that I served with, uh, young men, uh, are now getting uh, cancer, uh, brain cancer, uh, and other types of very uh, dangerous diseases that young men should not uh, be getting. Uh, so this is something that is very urgent uh, in our community. Uh, and so uh, thank you for Slotkin, President Slotkin and Ruiz uh, for really taking this uh, taking this seriously and, and really taking a hold of this. Mr. Burke, one of my questions that I have is, you know, you want people to start applying through the VA process now uh, for any conditions related to burn pits. The reason you're going to have a problem with that is because for 15 years, at least since I left the theater, we've been rejected for all of our claims. It's going to be hard to turn around that ship um, unless I think we actually have legislation that, that gives presumption. What is it that you think the VA can do now, uh, considering now you have 15 years of just absolute distrust that the, that the VA is going to take care of, you, take care of us, considering you know, what we've seen in the past? Yes, sir. Thank you. And and I would ask the committee not to take our lack of position on individual bills as our lack of acknowledgement that something needs to be done. Okay. The secretary is aware of that. In the meantime, while he works out his framework, while he makes this process better, while he capitalizes on the use of surveillance and more data, um, we are encouraging veterans to file. Uh, we spoke earlier in the hearing about you know, VAs need to do better outreach and to put the word out there. And by means of expressing to veterans, please file your claims. We do have an avenue today for direct service connection. Obviously, there the, the whole issue of presumption uh, is complicated, it's complex. The secretary is putting a new framework together. But in the meantime, we are increasing our communication. We are collecting more data. But most importantly, sir, we are we are deciding and benefits are going out. To, to, to some veterans who file um, for conditions related to toxic exposure. I would just say, Mr. Burke, this is going to be something very difficult to turn around. Uh, you know, when I first filed for my uh, PTSD claim in 2007, after being rejected, I didn't return to the VA again until 2015 uh, and uh, with a lot of uh, trauma in between. So you're going to have to really step up your game. Oh, yeah, Dr. Hastings, is that is that correct? Did I get the right name? Yes, Dr. Patrick. Hastings. Uh, looking at, uh, I put up on Twitter, you know, some, uh, you know, people, um, what kind of conditions they feel they're having because of exposure to fire pits. And one of the things that was really glaring to me was many women service members are uh, feel that they have symptoms that are, you know, either potentially going to hurt their reproductive ability. Uh, you know, I've actually seen seven women uh, talking about very heavy menstrual cycles that were abnormal. And then also, again, some of them also having problems with, uh, you, know, uh, you know, having children. Uh, have you seen any of these types of uh, cases popping up 
We and, actually, is, and more importantly, is the VA going to be ready for something like that? Because we're not, we haven't been really women friendly at the VA, especially when it comes to reproductive issues. Well, we are more women friendly. They actually have the Women's Health um, Department division, um, which reports directly to the Under Secretary for Health. It is it is that important um, to VA. We also are doing uh, research to find out why, because as you noted, um, there may be some fertility issues. Um, women in the military may delay having children, and that may be an impact. Um, it may be something that is um, the environment, so both have to be looked at. Um, the other issues um, that you uh, brought up are the concerns that they have in regards to, um, to fertility. Uh, we have a National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report that was just done looking at intergenerational effects. Um, there were no findings that were um, of concern other than with infectious disease at the time of pregnancy in that report. Um, but I'd ha be happy to put together a, um, a small uh, overview of women's health in the VA in conjunction with Dr. Patty Hayes, who runs that section. Thank you, and I, I'm out of time. I, I yield back my time. Thank you, Representative Gallego. And before I turn to a uh, call in on Ms. Kaptur, I do want to take note that uh, the Armed Services Committee is hosting its member day. Uh, and Chairman Smith has said, has echoed the comments I've heard today from our own members that agent that uh, that burn pits is this generation's uh, equivalent of Agent Orange. I'm heartened by Chairman Smith's statement. Um, I would take note that the Veterans Affairs uh, department and the Department of Defense are the largest uh, departments in the federal government. Uh, toxic exposures um, are a cost of war. Financial accountability cannot afford, and, and financial accountability for uh, these this cost of war cannot fall solely on uh, the Veterans Administration. Uh, there has to be shared accountability, um, and so uh, uh, with that, I will recognize. Uh, uh, a representative captor uh, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very, very important hearing and ranking member Bose. Thank you. Um, I uh, welcome the um, undersecretary, deputy secretary, and uh, all of your associates. Um, I'm haunted because I've served for a long time with the passing of many veterans that I have come to know personally. Uh, I remember a veteran uh, named Rotterdam who was Navy who came to see me very early on because of his nuclear exposure at L on an LST at Bikini Atoll. Uh, at that time, uh, the VA was not really looking at atomic injuries. And I saw the agony that that family endured. Um, uh, another veteran, a Marine, uh, who with his buddy served at Camp Pendleton back in the 50s, were in communication with one another prior to his death, a gentleman from my own community, beautiful human being, and they died not knowing um, whether or not their illnesses were related to uh, what they had ingested at Camp Pendleton. And then more recently, and I said this earlier in the hearing, meeting the general of the National Guard from New York, um, uh, General Rivera Smith, who uh, had served part of her many tours, uh, next to burn pits in Iraq and is public. She has uh, had cancers related to her service. And I keep saying to myself, why is science so lazy? Why can't we better pinpoint what is happening to these individuals? I uh, know that the VA research budget is uh, barely reaches a billion dollars a year. I chair a committee called Energy and Water. Our research budget is geometrically more than that. Uh, as well as the DOD budget. I serve on defense appropriations as well. I am looking for ideas to promote on the research front. For example, our Argonne lab in Illinois uh, has recently been doing a lot of photon imaging related to the human brain at such a uh, microscopic level, I can't even describe it, uh, but uh, they're looking at the uh, role of proteins uh, and um, uh, cellular exchange. For some of these conditions that are nuclear related or um, toxic exposure where there are given chemicals, honestly, I would just ask the VA 
uh, to contact us, to work with us, to find ways to push your research, to partner in research with those that you have in place. Uh, because you're right, um, I think it was uh, Representative Brownlee said, so much of it is stovepiped. I completely agree with her. And uh, just the electronic medical transfer between DOD and VA has been a great, a hapless mess uh, for uh, 20 years, over two decades. So some of the things that need to happen haven't happened uh, as quickly as we would hope, but just know that I would love to work with um, uh, Chairman DeCano and the members of the committee uh, to come up with some ideas to accelerate your research into these arenas at the same time as we try to help these veterans get the care that they need. So um, I just uh, wanted to ask uh, baseline, do you think that part of your problem is that science hasn't uh, moved fast enough for you to understand the medical conditions that you are dealing with? I will go ahead and, and start with that, um, ma'am. I am very heartened by what you've said with regards to um, support for research, and I'm sure that my epidemiologists um, will be very happy to hear that, as well as the Office of Research and Development here at VA, and we certainly can let you know about what we are doing and what we would like to do. Um, the Airborne Hazards Open Burn Pit Center of Excellence that you fund up at the um, site at East Orange, East Orange, New Jersey at the War Related Illness Study Center, uh, Illness and Injury Study Center does a considerable amount of work with um, their partners in academia, um, but we would always like to be able to do more. And I certainly will have some ideas um, that we will send to you that may be collaborations that you would be willing or would like to support. So often we find that we do basic research, which is extraordinarily important, and the energy labs are involved in that because of their imaging capabilities. But oftentimes we don't do the clinical trials. Uh, so uh, advanced clinical trials where we have DNA, we have different material, but it's not moving quickly enough through the research system. So I'm very open and I'm sure the chairman and, and ranking member are open to this as well. Give us ideas of where we can help you uh, get deeper into the medical conditions causing these camp cancers and so forth. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kaptur. We uh, I just always appreciate the, uh, the, the history and the, the respect for the institutional knowledge you have. Uh, Representative Lamb, thank you so much for your courtesy and you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the witnesses uh, hanging in there for us. Um, I think this question is for Mr. Burke, but anybody can answer it. Uh, I was following your comments earlier about really encouraging veterans to apply uh, for benefits if they believe that they had toxic exposure and are suffering the consequences of it. Um, my question to you is this, in, in very simple layman's terms, what is different this year and what is different in this administration about what will happen to their claim if they do apply? Has, has there been some change made that gives them a better prospect of success uh, in, in your knowledge? Or do we have to wait until this review is over to be able to say that? Is there anything you can say now about the likelihoods of success for a veteran who would be on the front end of an application? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. I'm going to ask my colleague from Compensation Service to speak to some of the recent guidance that we put out to the field uh, on the concession uh, of exposure. Uh, and I will tell you that that is already, uh, what Ms. Murphy, Ms. Murphy is going to speak about is already in place. It's already in practice. Claims are being adjudicated under this premise. Um, and so and I'll refer to- in our, The concession of exposure that the exposure took place. Is that is that new as of 2021? Uh, no, sir. That has been in our procedures manual for some time now. Okay, so yeah, um, but so my it, question is, is there anything that's new now about the way these claims are going to get adjudicated? Um, I, I would say not, not anything um, drastically new. Uh, something I did want to point out, though, is that in working with DOD, we have had greater emphasis on working with service members to start filing their claims before they get out of service. So that helps to close the gap on, you know, wondering what happens, gathering the evidence. And just um, as of the last couple of months ago, uh, for the first time, our benefits uh, deliberate discharge claims can now be filed online through va.gov. 
And with this uh, generation of uh, service members, uh, soon to be veterans, uh, I think they like that online experience, that self-service 24 seven, and that is now available to them. So uh, just the advice I would give is file the claim, file it online and make sure that during uh, the examination, your, uh, your discharge examination that you get on record uh, with anything that uh, you may have experienced while you're in service. No, and I, I appreciate that. But you, as you can tell from many of our questions today, we, we all represent a lot of people for whom that is too late. I mean, they've been out of the military already for a while. So um, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that this administration has not made any change to the actual merits of these claims or the guidance you're giving on the adjudication of them that would affect the likelihood of success, right? So if, I, no. if I'm a veteran, I'm just as likely to have succeeded by applying last year as by applying today, is that right? Uh, yes, sir, uh, to date, but as uh, Mr. Burke has identified, the secretary is taking a new approach. Um, I, he's not been here a hundred days, but he has put this to the forefront of importance uh, across all of VA. And thank you for that. Last, last question for me is, is there a timeline on that process? You guys might have already said it and I missed it. I apologize. But whatever review is taking place, is there a timeline on that? Yes, sir. The secretary is doing a 180 day review. His goal is to brief out on the model, uh, the framework of that model uh, within 180 days. And that would include notification of the framework uh, to VSOs, Congress, of course, and other stakeholders. Great. Thank you all for your service. I very much appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Uh, uh, we are uh, now, uh, uh, I understand the ranking member uh, has indicated that uh, he is pressed for time. And uh, so I therefore will not uh, extend questioning on this second panel and we'll move straight into the third panel. And um, uh, and so I would like to uh, uh, introduce our third panel. I would like to excuse our, our second panel, so the VA panelists, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here today. Uh, and uh, we will now uh, virtually bring in our third panel, uh, which are the representatives from the various advocacy groups appearing before us today. I'll just pause just for few moments until we can swap out virtually the second panel for the third panel. Okay, it looks like we're in here. Okay. All right. Um, for our third panel, we have representatives from the various advocacy groups. Uh, we have uh, Alex uh, Moroski, Government Affairs Specialist at the Wounded Warrior Project. Travis Hoare, the uh, Government Affairs Director for Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Shane Learman. Deputy National Legislative Director for Benefits for the Disabled American Veterans, and Christina Keenan, Associate Director for Disability Assistance and Memorial Affairs for the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and Native uh, and Navy Combat Veteran James L. Price. I'll remind our witnesses to please pause for two or three seconds before speaking so that the recording will capture all of your words, and please remember to do so when answering members' questions. Your statements in full will be included in the hearing record without objection. Mr. Morosky, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boss, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting Wounded Warrior Project to testify at today's hearing to offer our views on pending legislation. The bills we're discussing today address the urgent issue of toxic exposure, a top priority for our organization and the warriors we represent, and one we feel Congress must take action on without delay. This year, September 11th, will mark the 20th anniversary of the beginning of the global war on terrorism. Since then, as many as 3.5 million post 9-11 veterans served in areas where they were exposed to burn pits and other toxic substances. And now, 
Many of them have developed rare and early onset diseases like cancers, respiratory conditions, and other serious illnesses. Due to the unique challenges associated with toxic exposure claims, most of these veterans have been unsuccessful in their attempt to have VA accept their illnesses as service connected. Compounding these issues is the fact that after two decades of war, the science remains disappointingly inconclusive. While the National Academies have yet to find an association between these conditions and exposure, they have made clear that this is due to insufficient data. And as a result, they recommend new epidemiologic studies, but these can take years and that is time that many serious ill veterans just don't have. To bypass this scientific gridlock, Wounded Warrior Project supports H.R. 2372, the Warfighters Act, and H.R. 2368, the Covenant Act, which would establish presumption of service connection for any veteran who served in an area of known exposure and is now suffering from any one of over 20 different cancers, serious respiratory conditions, or certain other illnesses. And for them, disability compensation would be a lifeline, giving them a chance to support themselves and their families while continuing to battle their illnesses. And those whose conditions are terminal would be afforded a sense of peace, knowing that their families would have the support of DIC after they pass already. Far too many of them have lost their health, their jobs, and even their lives. And with no end in sight, it is unreasonable to continue to ask them to wait for science that may never come when we clearly have the opportunity and the ability to help them now. For this reason, we believe that the Warfighters Act and the Covenant Act must be included in any comprehensive toxic exposure solution this Congress. The second key bill I'd like to highlight is H.R. 2436, the Veterans Burn Pit Exposure Recognition Act, which, along with the Covenant Act, would concede exposure to burn pits and other toxic substances for veterans who served in areas where they're known to have been in use. All too often, veterans' claims are denied simply because they're unable to produce evidence of an exposure that was often never documented in the first place. Current law grants concession of exposure for Vietnam veterans many of whom lack documentation of where and when they were exposed to Agent Orange. And current era veterans deserve concession of exposure for the same reason. We note that even if a list of presumptive disabilities was established for burn pit exposure, concession of exposure would still be necessary for any veteran claiming direct service connection for a condition that's not on the list. For this reason, we strongly support concession of exposure and see it as another critical piece of any comprehensive toxic exposure solution. Finally, I'd like to highlight H.R. 2127, the TEAM Act. This forward-thinking bill would grant permanent VA health care eligibility to all veterans who served in areas of known exposure, regardless of their disability claim status. This would prevent veterans who were already ill from having to wait months while their claims are decided to access potentially life-saving care. And those who were exposed but may not be ill would have access to preventative care. Veterans of previous generations who were exposed have permanent access to care for these reasons. And we see this as absolutely critical for the current era and beyond as well. The team act would also establish a permanent independent commission and a scientific framework to trigger VA determinations on additional conditions for presumptive service connection. And unlike previous frameworks, this would not be limited to specific conflicts or exposures. And what's truly remarkable about the team act is that it would extend on a permanent basis two important components of any toxic exposure legislation, healthcare eligibility and a scientific framework to apply to all toxic exposures regardless of era or location, foreign or domestic, now and in the future. This would finally ensure that the next generation of veterans who are exposed to toxic substances are not once again starting off from square one, like every generation before them. Furthermore, when taken together, we see each of these bills as complementary to one another, fitting together like pieces of a puzzle to fully address toxic exposure concerns, not only for the current generation of veterans, but for future generations as well. And accordingly, we ask this committee and Congress to pass this important legislation without delay, and we strongly believe that the time to act is now. Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boss, thank you once again for offering Wounded Warrior Project the opportunity to testify today. This concludes my statement, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Morosky. Uh, Mr. Hoare, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your statement. Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boss, and distinguished members of the committee, on behalf of IAVA and our more than 425,000 members, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to submit our testimony for today's hearing on one of our top priorities for the 117th Congress, addressing injuries from burn pits and other toxic exposures. 
Year after year, the concern grows surrounding the health impacts of burn pits and toxic exposures in recent conflicts. According to our most recent member survey, 86% of our members were exposed to burn pits during their deployments, and 88% of those exposed believe they already have or may have symptoms. For many that feel they are suffering from their exposure to burn pits or other toxic exposures, assessing quality care can be a challenge. According to the VA, over 70% of disability claims for toxic exposures are still being denied. Like many of our members, I was exposed to a burn pit on a daily basis during my deployment to Afghanistan. The burn pit was an all too common feature in our small patrol base, and I had the responsibility of keeping the burn pit burning. At the end of almost every day, I would take roughly half a gallon of jet fuel and spread it around the burn pit. I would then take a piece of cardboard, also covered in jet fuel, light it on fire, and throw it in to light the burn pit. It was the only way we were able to dispose of our trash, which included plastics from water bottles, MREs, food waste, human waste, animal carcasses, batteries, and spent ammunition, and more. All of it was put together in a six-foot deep pit and set on fire with jet fuel. It was an all too normal and mundane part of mine and so many other deployments. We were never warned of any health effects or to try to keep our distance as difficult as that would have been. Uh, like many of the things during our deployment, it was just something to accept and move on. 10 years later, I feel extremely fortunate not to have any noticeable health effects due to this exposure. However, I am no longer naive to believe that this will always be the case. IVA thanks the committee for holding this important hearing and considering a large number of bills that will address not only veterans that have been exposed to burn pits, but also Vietnam era veterans and veterans from other areas, other eras that were exposed to dangerous radiation. There are other hazards beyond burn pits that occurred that may pose a danger for respiratory illnesses and cancers. And it is past time that comprehensive action is taken to address the growing concern that our exposures have had severe impacts on veterans' long-term health. IVA is extremely supportive of the Warfighters Act, the TEAM Act, and the Veterans Burn Pit Exposure Recognition Act. We believe that these bills are crucial for veterans that have been exposed to burn pits and other toxic exposures. The Warfighters Act is an incredibly important landmark legislation which would create a presumption of service connection for illnesses of veterans that have deployed since 1990. This legislation is needed for those veterans that are sick and dying and unable to prove that their health problems are service related. This would ensure that we do not repeat past mistakes when it comes to veterans that have toxic exposures. Creating a presumptive benefit for veterans that are suffering would remove the burden of proof that a burn pit or overseas toxic exposures is the direct cause of their illness. Many veterans might not become sick for years after their exposure, making their claims process more complicated and proving a direct link to their illness incredibly difficult. Any final toxic exposure legislation absolutely must have the presumptive service connection that the Warfighters Act would establish. Additionally, the TEAM Act will ensure that all veterans are able to access high quality VA care for any toxic related issue. By expanding the eligibility of VA healthcare to cover veterans that have been exposed to toxins, we can ensure that no veteran falls through the cracks again. This legislation would also create a framework for an independent commission to establish presumptive conditions for veterans that will cover all toxic exposures, both foreign and domestic, into the future. This will protect future generations of veterans from exposure that are impossible to predict today. IAVA was proud to join with our VSO allies and the team coalition and our congressional partners to introduce this legislation and are we committed to seeing its passage. The Veterans Burn Pit Exposure Recognition Act is another critically important piece of legislation in order to address toxic exposures. This bill would finally con concede exposure to a large number of chemicals for all veterans that have served in areas where burn pits were widely used, and IAVA fully supports this legislation. IAVA, our VSO allies, and many members of this committee have been on the forefront of toxic exposure issue for years. Important legislation has been passed in recent years that strengthens the registry, increases tracking, reporting, and researching these exposures. However, more must be done. We will continue to fight until there have been access, until veterans have access to the healthcare and benefits that they rightfully deserve. Members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to share IAVA's views on these issues today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have and working with the committee in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoare, and thank you for sharing your, your very personal uh, story. Uh, I now recognize uh, Mr. Learman uh, for his five minutes, uh, for five minutes to present uh, his statement. Thank you. Chairman Ticano, ranking member Boss, and members of the committee. On behalf of DAV's more than 1 million members who have wartime service-related wounds, injuries, diseases, and illnesses, we thank you for the opportunity to offer our views 
on the multiple toxic exposure bills impacting service disabled veterans, their families, and survivors. A written testimony discusses all of the bills before us today as I will focus my remarks on some of them. Mr. Chairman, for more than 100 years, our fighting men and women have been vulnerable to the horrors of mustard gas, atomic radiation, Agent Orange, oil fires, nerve agents, burn pits, and other lethal hazards. Too often, our nation has been slow to provide these men and women with the needed health care and benefits they have earned. Right now, there is more legislation addressing toxic exposures than ever before. The men and women who put themselves in harm's way have been suffering for decades and have been waiting far too long for access to VA health care and benefits. Many Vietnam veterans are still waiting for recognition of their Agent Orange exposure and the many diseases related there too. We thank this committee for their efforts in adding three new Agent Orange presumptive diseases, and we must not relent in adding other diseases that have significant positive scientific association. Therefore, DAV supports the Fair Care for Vietnam Veterans Act to add hypertension and monoclonal gammopathy of unspecified significance as Agent Orange diseases. We must continue to acknowledge those exposed to Agent Orange in other countries outside of Vietnam, such as Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. Thus, DAV supports the Veterans Agent Orange Exposure Equity Act. The Agent Orange Act of 1991 had many provisions expire in October of 2015, which ended the Secretary's requirement to swiftly review and add presumptive diseases. We support the Keeping Our Promises Act as it will reauthorize those provisions until 2030. There are many other exposures that VA still has not conceded or granted eligibility for health care and benefits. That is why DAV supports the K2 Veterans Care Act, the Mark Takai Atomic Veterans Health Care Parity Act, the Palamas Veterans Act, and the proposed drafts for the Fort McClellan Health Registry Act and the PFAS Registry Act. Mr. Chairman, we have a historic opportunity to address toxic exposures now and in the years ahead by removing barriers for direct service connection, providing health care, establishing presumptive diseases, and creating a future framework. Assembled together, several of these bills before us today can address the toxic exposures puzzle, such as the Veterans Burn Pits Exposure Recognition Act, which would concede exposure to over 40 VA-acknowledged chemicals for all veterans who served in countries where burn pits are known to have been widely used. It would remove barriers for direct service connection and require VA exams with medical opinions if VA does not have enough evidence to grant the claim. The Covenant Act would establish presumptive service connection for 13 different diseases due to burn pit exposure, concede exposure, and establish VA healthcare eligibility. Further, it would also require specific training and education curriculum for all medical providers conducting exams and providing medical opinions. The TEAM Act would provide permanent healthcare enrollment eligibility for all veterans who were exposed to toxins. It would also create a framework with an independent commission charged with recommending additional presumptive conditions. The presumptive benefits for war fighters exposed to burn pits and other toxins act would extend presumptive service connection for serious respiratory conditions and cancers that may be linked to exposure to burn pits and other chemicals. Mr. Chairman, for the millions of veterans suffering from exposure to radiation, Agent Orange, burn pits and other toxic hazards, we must not miss this opportunity. It is unreasonable to ask critically ill veterans to continue to wait. Toxic exposure legislation is not premature, nor has any of it been rushed. Actually, it is long past due. The time to act is now. This concludes my testimony, and I look forward to any questions you and the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Learman. Uh, Ms. Keenan, you are now recognized for five minutes to deliver your statement. Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Bost, and members of the committee, on behalf of the men and women of the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States and its auxiliary, 
thank you for the opportunity to provide our remarks on legislation pending before this committee. Let me begin by saying that I'm an Army veteran of the post 9-11 era. My mother was an Air Force veteran of the Vietnam era. She passed away exactly 12 weeks ago today from interstitial lung disease, one of the conditions listed in a couple of the bills mentioned today. We'll never know if this rare disease was linked to her time in service because she passed away 10 days after receiving her diagnosis. Many veterans of her generation didn't know or trust VA to treat their health conditions resulting from their service, unlike veterans today who are filing claims and attempting to ac access VA healthcare only to be denied or turned away. Toxic exposures have touched every generation of veterans and has become synonymous with service. The BFW urges Congress to work in a bipartisan and bicameral manner and pass legislation to address the urgent needs of veterans suffering from conditions due to military toxic exposures. Now is the time to develop a comprehensive and permanent solution. Veterans struggling in getting toxic exposure claims at VA due to veterans struggle in getting toxic exposure claims approved at VA due to the burden of proof, which falls too heavily on them when asked to provide evidence for benefits and care. The fact that VA denies 78% of disability claims related to burn pits shows the difficulty veterans face when attempting to access these services. The VFW believes it's essential to pass legislation, which includes presumptive conditions, concession of exposure, health care for anyone exposed, a framework for future exposures, and training for exposure claims. This would ensure that veterans from all operations, foreign and domestic, now and in the future, have an efficient and transparent path to the care and benefits they need. What we're asking for isn't new. It took decades to achieve these very same benefits for veterans of the Vietnam era. We want the same for veterans of all generations without making them wait for years and without having to reinvent the process again and again. The presumptive benefits for warfighters exposed to burn pits and other toxins act would extend presumptive service connection for more than 20 serious respiratory conditions and cancers that may be linked to exposure to burn pits and other chemicals. This would provide immediate care for exposed veterans. The Veterans Burn Pit Exposure Recognition Act would concede exposure to dozens of chemicals for veterans who served in areas where burn pits are known to have been widely used. The TEAM Act would provide permanent healthcare enrollment eligibility for all veterans who were exposed, regardless of their disability claim status. It would also create a framework with an independent commission charged with establish, establishing additional presumptive conditions that stem from toxic exposures. Together, these three bills, along with others, which cover veterans from K2, Vietnam, and other locations around the globe, will create a complete package, just like the pieces of a puzzle, to cover as many veterans as possible. And finally, last week, VA representatives testified in front of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee and twice stated that toxic exposure legislation at this point is premature. Premature. Is it premature for veterans who are sick? Is it premature for the veterans who are dying? Toxic exposures has been around for decades and nothing, nothing about this discussion is premature. In fact, it's long overdue. What we know is that VA processes toxic exposure claims in an inconsistent manner. We also know that different VA secretaries have viewed toxic exposure issues differently. Legislation has worked in the past and legislation is absolutely necessary now to direct VA and to create a comprehensive and permanent solution once and for all. The time to act is now. Chairman Takano, this concludes my testimony. I'm prepared to answer any questions you or the committee members may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keenan. Uh, I, I now turn to our final witness. Uh, and before I do, I just want to say to Mr. Price uh, that I express my sincere condolences for the recent passing of uh, your wife, Lauren, and uh, just profoundly moved by the commitment that both of you had toward our nation's veterans. 
And it's a true testament to your commitment to our veterans today that you are actually appearing before our committee given uh, your monumental loss. So we thank you for that commitment. Um, Mr. Price, you're recognized for five minutes uh, to present your statement. Thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boast, members of the House Committee of Veterans Affairs, thank you for this opportunity to speak today. There is too much for me to say to fit into five minutes, so I urge you, please take the time to read my written statement. My name is Jim Price, but I'm not the one that should be speaking to you today. The person that should be speaking is my wife, Lauren, a 100% disabled US Navy veteran. We were deployed to Iraq in 2007 to 2008, and we were exposed to toxins from burn pits. Lauren and I founded Veteran Warriors. She cannot be with us today because she died from her exposure to these toxins just five weeks ago. Toxic exposure caused a litany of issues with my wife, but I will talk about the three big ones. In 2009, she was diagnosed with a terminal lung condition, constrictive bronchiolitis, which resulted in her retirement from the Navy in 2010. This condition caused her lungs to decrease in capacity to 35% over the course of a few years. In 2018, at the age of 53, Lauren was referred to an ophthalmologist and eventually a neurologist. She was diagnosed with decaying white matter in and lesions on her brain. After testing, it was revealed that Lauren had the reaction time and short-term memory retention equivalent to that of an 80-year-old. Toxic exposure caused this. In June of 2020, Lauren developed gastrointestinal issues. We saw numerous doctors and specialists over the course of eight months. On February 14th, 2021, the doctor told us that Lauren had a rare cancer. This cancer was caused by toxic exposure and was not curable. The oncologists believe that with chemotherapy, Lauren could live for 12 to 18 months. After a whirlwind battle, Lauren passed away on March 30th, 2021, at the age of 56. Not 12 to 18 months after the diagnosis of cancer, 44 days. This is what toxic exposure can do. We had been home from Iraq for 13 years. It is imperative that we care for my fellow veterans with toxic exposure, not just limited to burn pits. We should be concerned about chemical, biological, radiation, and environmental exposures, not just limited to Iraq, as are many, uh, many other countries, including Syria, and even some locations within the United States. It's critical that we as a nation identify and provide care to these individuals within a reasonable amount of time. We must identify potentially toxic exposure personnel candidates and monitor these individuals. We must provide health care for these individuals identified with toxic exposure. Care is the priority because compensation benefits do not help someone that is dead because they didn't get care. Mr. Burke, there is no time to file a claim and wait for an answer to see if a veteran is qualified for care. The VA should acknowledge current scientific data and respond to new data regarding diseases associated with toxic exposure. The VA should provide disability ratings and presumptions of service for toxic exposure. And lastly, the VA should provide training on toxic exposure to VA healthcare personnel. In case you didn't know it, the VA already has a policy in place regarding toxic exposure from burn pits. Training letter 10 TAC 3 was issued in 2010. However, this letter does not address all needed items. It's a VA policy, not a law, and most significantly, the VA does not follow it. If the VA is on board with dealing with toxic exposure, why has it become necessary for all of this legislation to become generated? As a veteran affected in multiple ways by toxic exposure, I support, fully support any bill that helps or provides care for veterans 
and I know Lauren did too. She believed that toxic exposure for her specifically burn pits is this era's Agent Orange. I and Lauren feel that the team act is most closely aligned with what we would like to see and is the most inclusive legislation towards a path forward. But there are many good legislative items out there that can work together. Lauren paid the ultimate sacrifice and made enormous efforts until her death to ensure that this would not happen to others. While in Iraq, I was almost always within 500 yards of Lauren, breathing the same air and traveling the same routes. Every day I wonder, is today the day that toxic exposure catches up with me? Thank you for your time. And again, please take the time to read the full written statement. Thank you, Mr. Price, for your testimony and uh, be assured that uh, though uh, Lauren has departed, your appearance today uh, has uh, given us her voice uh, at today's hearing. And uh, you, your devotion to her is more than, uh, is, is very apparent. And, uh, and, and you, you have been the purveyor of her voice and that continues to live uh, here at this hearing. And Ms. Keenan, uh, I, I want to also acknowledge the passing of your mother and uh, the devotion, uh, the loving devotion that you uh, express for her uh, just a few days before Mother's Day uh, and uh, through your appearance uh, and your representation of her story to today's committee. And uh, these are indeed poignant, uh, poignant personal stories uh, that my belief, in my belief that we are building the momentum uh, in Congress uh, uh, to do something uh, and to act uh, and to address the exposure, uh, the toxic exposures, uh, to address the, the, the great issue of our veterans being exposed to toxic exposures. And I see on a bipartisan basis, uh, your stories having tremendous impact. So thank you very much for your courage and your willingness to step forward and to, to be so personal uh, in in your testimony. So thank you. Chairman, you're muted. Did I mute myself? Thank you. I will unmute myself. Uh, I will turn to the questions tab. Um, to get to my, okay, so panel three. So uh, to all the witnesses, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Um, what is clear to me is that we need to take action on this, on, on toxic exposures and uh, Congress stands ready to act as evidenced by the 15 bills on this agenda. Uh, but is this enough? Based on your experience working directly uh, in the claims process, do the bills today go far enough? If each of you could speak to that point, uh, and if if there if it's not enough, what are we missing? So very briefly, let's just start uh, with uh, you know the first witness, uh, Mr. Morosky, and then move on through the roster, Mr. Morosky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's an excellent question, and you know say that uh, Wounded Warrior Project, uh, our service officers. Pro uh, process tens of thousands of claims a year. And so certainly, um, you know, the toxic exposure claims uh, have unique challenges. You know, the, the, the disability compensation system works pretty well for most other, uh, especially physical injuries, but there are unique challenges associated with toxic exposures. You know, number one, uh, veterans just don't have proof of their exposure. Um, VA, um, you know, I we appreciate the fact that VA is saying that they do concede exposure. We're saying that VA, we're seeing that VA often does not concede exposure. Uh, for Southwest Asia in all cases. And so since there's no in-service event, then VA won't speculate on a nexus and the claim is rejected. And so um, the, the bills that would offer concession of exposure would solve that problem. Um, number two, um, compensation and pension examiners just aren't willing to sort of opine on a positive nexus that, you know, uh, sleeping next to a burn pit where tires were burned with jet fuel for two years um, 
is as likely as not linked to a veteran's current diagnosis of a rare brain cancer and so forth. They're willing to, you know, whereas they're willing to say things like, well, I see you have 50 parachute jumps and we're willing to opine that, you know, your bad knees are because of that. When it comes to toxic exposures, they're often not willing to make the same leap. Um, I think that, um, you know, partly the training in uh, the Covenant Act and some others could help with that, but really that's a cultural VA issue that really has to be dealt with, I think, on a very long term and and, and will require a lot of oversight to get sort of uh, the mindset to shift in that case. And then also the third thing that we see is that uh, claims are toxic exposure claims are sometimes rejected just on the basis that they say, well, the condition that you're claiming is not presumptive, therefore it's rejected when in fact VA should be adjudicating those claims on a direct basis. Um, but instead, they're just sort of bouncing it off a list of presumptions and then uh, rejecting them uh, on that basis. And then we have to go to the board to get that overturned. And that's time that, that you know, the veterans uh, don't have. So those are, those are three of the big challenges that we're seeing, sir. Um, thank okay. you. I, well, I, I would want to quickly move on to Mr. Learman. Uh, my time is running short. If you could quickly sort of address my what's missing, uh, if there's anything missing, Mr. Learman. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I think when you take a look at all of these together, it's hard to find something missing because each one of these bills does something that will help further this for years to come because there are certain exposures we aren't aware of yet. So I think what we've assembled, a pieces of a lot of these can go a long way to solve the puzzle that, that, that we're faced with. In reference to the concession of exposure, as, as VA was talking about, they conceded. One thing I just really wanted to point out they don't tell the veteran what they were actually exposed to. While they have a list of over 40 chemicals, they never tell the veteran that. They never give them a list. There were a lot of things the bills today can fix and hopefully in the future solve some of these so we're not coming back every few years to try to readdress them. All right. Well, well thank you. Mr. Hoare, I, I skipped over you. Can you quickly uh, weigh in here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I I agree with um, my colleague, my VSO colleagues, that there is a there's a lot of good in here. I think the the challenges of is it enough is that we might not know until years down the line. Uh, much like the Vietnam era veterans are still coming back, and we're still adding presumptives to that list. Um, that's why you know IVA is extremely supportive of creating a framework into the future. So as um, Mr. Learman said, we don't need to. Uh, veterans don't need to keep coming back to get congressional approval, but we will have a working framework for future exposures that it's impossible to predict today. Thank you. Ms. Keenan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to reiterate, the legislation proposed today is absolutely necessary. Um, if several of the bills are combined, we think that it will have a greater impact on as many veterans as possible who need benefits today and in the future. Well, thank you. And quickly, Mr. Price. I agree completely. Probably the biggest thing is that it's written into VA doctrine that when an item is on the fence and there is doubt, it should fall in the veteran's favor. And that's not being done. Thank you for that. Um, Ranking Member Boss, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and um, I, I want to associate myself with your remarks, uh, both to Mr. Price for the loss of his wife and also uh, to uh, Ms. Crin uh, for the loss of her mother. But Mr. Price, I, you know, I know that Lauren was very involved in the, the team coalition and in the drafting of the team act. So if you could kind of expand why you support the bill and what do you think your late wife would say about the team act and the importance of seeing it signed into law if she were here today. Thank you, ranking member Bose. Uh, probably the biggest item that is of, that aligns most with what Lauren and I thought was that uh, based on a preset of conditions, which is basically a, a award medal based on where an individual is deployed over a given time frame, that care is automatically granted immediately. And I said it during my testimony that um, health care is a priority. Benefits are great and they will help later on down the road, but benefits in the means of, in the form of compensation means nothing to somebody is, that is dead because they didn't get care. That is probably the biggest item from that bill that we like. 
uh, the additional parts where uh, VA uh, works with uh, science organizations to uh, bring in that data, acknowledge the existing data, and use it to additionally groom the requirements and criteria of presumptives uh, and a, a kind of over overstated or over missed item at times is the fact that VA personnel, medical and when necessary rating personnel need to be trained on toxic exposure so that these items can be identified. Yeah. Thank you, M Mr. Um, Morosky. Uh, in your response to the questions about the team act and other bills during the second panel, VA did not give the same impression of urgency uh, to enact legislation for toxic exposure veterans that my colleagues and I share. Do you believe that we need to wait or should Congress act now? Uh, Congressman, many of the veterans that I talk to, especially the ones who are already sick, um, would say that the time is long overdue. Um, I would certainly say that we feel that the time to act is now and we would urge the committee to move swiftly on these bills, sir. Would any of the other BSOs like to respond to that? Yes, Mr. Ranking Member, we'd just like to reiterate the same, the same point that veterans have been waiting for years already. Um, so we need to take care of veterans who are suffering now, but also put a system into place, a framework into place that will help veterans who are exposed in the future. Veterans like myself who have no no conditions today, but what will happen in 5, 10, 20 years from now. Thank you. And yes, ranking member, um, we agree. Something needs to be done. Do we want to collaborate with VA? Absolutely. Should we wait for VA before Congress takes action for everybody who's suffering? No. Time to act is now. I would like to just reiterate all of this, that you know, there are veterans sick and dying. There are veterans that have already passed because of their exposures, because of these wars. The, the war in Afghanistan is turning 20 this year. Um, at the time is, at, is, is now. Yeah, and, and I've got other questions, but I want to just make a statement here if I can. And, and I, it is my hope that the VA comes back to us uh, as quickly as possible to respond to each one of these bills, to try to give input where they want to give input, uh, because Folks, it is time that we dealt with this issue. It, the can has been kicked down the road long enough. And I think that the VA's response, and that's what I said to the other panel, is that they seem to misunderstand the, their mission. Their mission, yes, is to help the veterans, but their mission is also to follow the bills and, and follow the law that we put in place. And it is, we're going to do something, whether they want to come in and give input or not and we've got to do it and we need to do it now. And so as we move forward, I think that, that the realization that they need is, is that um, you, we can't keep going down this path. Veterans have to have the response necessary and they need it as quickly as possible. And I thank the chairman and other members here uh, for recognizing how important the, this issue is. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Bost. I call on uh, Chair Luria uh, to uh, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Takano, um, and you know, thank you to our witnesses who represent the VSOs and for all the work that you do on behalf of our veterans and Mr. Price. Um, you know, thank you for sharing the story uh, about Lauren and her service and her struggle um, and how this toxic exposure impacted her health. It is incredibly moving and touching. And I think that stories like hers you know, motivate us, uh, all of us, um, and you know, make us understand how important this work that we're doing today um, is for, for veterans uh, like yourself and like Lauren. Um, so I have a, a question I, I really want to allow, you know, each witness on this panel to, to chime in and, and provide some feedback on this, but you know, with a denial rate of 78% today for claims involving toxic exposure, it's clear to me that something in this benefits process is amiss. And, you know, just from each of your organizations, from the veterans you work with, um, could you each share what you think the biggest obstacle today is for claimants who are trying to file a claim uh, related to toxic exposure? And um, maybe, Christina, you could start. 
Thank you, Chair Luria. The issues facing uh, veterans when it comes to their claims in healthcare um, are, are several. Um, they're having problems establishing that nexus between their condition um, and their exposure. They're having problems proving their exposure. Um, they're having problems accessing the healthcare that they need right away. Um, and, and they're experiencing um, VA professionals that, that aren't aware of what their exposures could be. So they're, they're experiencing a variety of problems and we think that legislation is the proper fix for these issues. Thank you. Um, Mr. Learman, um, Shane, I would love to hear your perspective and, and DAV's members. Uh, thank you, Chair, Chair Luria. We believe that one of the biggest problems that they're faced with the burn pit denial rate being so high is really twofold. One, veterans aren't being told what they're exposed to. VA says they're conceding exposure to these chemicals. They're not providing that list to a veteran. So now how can a veteran actually take that to a different physician to get a medical opinion or a nexus. That, mm -hmm. That's very difficult to do. The other problem with that is if they're coming to the table with a condition and that exposure being conceded, if VA determines, a VA rating specialist to tell them, determines they don't need an exam, they don't get one. One of the largest reasons these claims are being denied is because of that medical nexus. Mm -hmm. There are two bills uh, before us today that could actually fix that problem. Um, something needs to be done, otherwise this denial rate will continue. Well, thank you. And um, in the time remaining, um, Travis Hoare or Alexander Maroski, do, do you have additional things to add um, that you're hearing from, from your members and from the veterans that you work with? I, I would just like to add that I think um, it's, it's been touched on, but proving exposure can be incredibly difficult. As we all know, the DOD records were not exactly uh, perfect. Um, for my own example, I was in a patrol base with 10 Marines. Uh, we were almost outnumbered to A and A to Marines. Um, there wasn't any sort of data collection there that we were doing a burn pit. It was just our company orders that we, we had to do. So proving that exposure um, can be incredibly difficult. And the time that passes that some of these diseases can take to manifest themselves can also add to that complication. Thank you. Um, Mr. Morosky. Yes, Congresswoman, um, I want to reiterate, uh, like everyone else, the concession of exposure issue, and then also kind of reiterate what I was saying before about just an unwillingness specifically on toxic exposure for uh, CMP examiners to make the nexus when a reasonable person would say, look, at, you know, the amount of exposure that this person experienced and the rarity of the, you know, let's say the cancer that they're experiencing now to say that it's as likely as not. We've seen these rejected over and over again, um, you know, at the, at, the, at the regular VA level. One of the things that we've done is solicited opinions from the risk center, which is the war related illness and injury center, which is VA's arm that specializes in toxic exposures. And many, many times when we elevate them, the risk doctors will come back and say, well, of course, it's as likely as not that this pancreatic cancer was caused by this prolonged burn pit exposure. But at the lower levels of VA, at the regional office level, it is just not happening. It is they're rejected over and over. Well, well, thank you. And in a little bit of time remaining, um, Mr. Price, did, did you have anything additional to, to share from, from your experience or Lauren's? I just wanted to use a quick analogy for you're talking about the percentage of people that have been denied, um, and it's essentially due to the knowledge of VA personnel. But for the people that are approved, getting care for, a, for an issue is still a problem. Uh, Lauren waited 15 months to see the pulmonary specialist at the local VA hospital. And when we went in to go see the pulmonologist, his statement to her was until your acid reflux is under control and your PTS is cured, we're not gonna do anything for the treatment of your constructive bronchiolitis. Mm. And it's a knowledge level of VA personnel. Okay, well, well, thank you for sharing that. And um, I know, Mr. Chairman, my, my time is out, but I just want to summarize very briefly. I think what I've heard from all of our uh, members on this panel um, is that the legislation we consider today 
um, in totality contains in some form all of these pieces that were discussed um, as the greatest needs in getting these claims processed successfully. So I view them as pieces to a puzzle. Um, I think that we need to work together and this hearing is the first step in that to bring this legislation together into a comprehensive approach. And I, I thank you for your leadership on that and, and look forward to working with you and other members both on and off the committee to, to make this happen for our veterans. Well, thank you, Chair Leary, uh, and uh, I don't begrudge you at all that summary. And uh, in fact, I greatly uh, welcome it and appreciate well, it. They and, uh, uh, I want to say that uh, I'm heartened by the bipartisan participation uh, and uh, the passion that I see from both sides about wanting to do something, uh, not just do something, wanting to do what we have to do uh, for, the, for all of those who've borne the battle. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I'm going to recognize the very passionate uh, gentleman from Montana, Mr. Rosendale. Is Mr. Rosendale? Uh, I'm in. I'm with you. Okay, sir. Uh, you Thank you, Mr. Question. Chair. I, I appreciate it. It's good seeing everybody again. Uh, Ms. Keenan, please elaborate on VFW's belief that an independent panel to identify and study toxic exposures is important and tell us whether the commission that would be established in the team act would meet that goal in a timely manner because clearly everything that we are talking about here today focuses not not, not just on, on treatment and recognition but the timeliness of that thank you for that question sir yes we we see this this appropriate um framework within the team act um you know we can't wait for va to try to fix policies and procedures internally and have them reviewed. We need the legislation to impose this framework. Um, and it's important that the scientific review board and the commission be independent from VA so that veterans are assured that there is a, um, a fair review of the science available. Very good. And, and you feel that, that, that this is the most effective way for us to do it in, in, in that t timely fashion. We believe that the framework, which echoes parts of the um, very effective Agent Orange Act framework, um, will be effective and will be able to help as many veterans now and in the future. Okay. And why does the VAFW recommend that NA NAS specifically review the health effects of, of the toxic exposure? We would be flexible um, if there was any, you know, um, scientific body which was um, independent from VA. We, we like the National Academies because there's been an experience with a collaboration between the National Academies and VA. So that's, that's what we've been supporting, but we'd be open to other ideas as long as it was independent from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Okay, so the big thing is the independency and should this be required in, in any comprehensive toxic exposure legislation that this committee advances? We believe it's essential um, it's an essential component, as we talked about, the pieces of the puzzle, and it's one of those very important key pieces. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would yield back the, the balance of my time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rosendale. I now turn to uh, the gentleman from the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, Mr. Sablon, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing um, again. To the witnesses, um, I have uh, always had a depth of respect for the veteran service organizations for all the work you do for your members and and and, uh, and eventually even your non-members benefit. I do need to give a shout out to Miss Keenan because the Veterans of Foreign Wars is the only VSO that it has a, a ch chapter here in the Marianas, but. Uh, um, Mr. Price, um, there are times in, in hearings when after a hearing ends, uh, people tend to forget what a witness said, but um, you, sir, your testimony today, I know, will be remembered and will even be discussed among some of the members. Um, so again, my deep condolences to you and, and to you on your loss of your wife, and I hope you and um, I think Ms. Keenan also uh, don't, will never have to suffer what your spouse went through. 
I associate myself with Ms. Chairwoman Luria's statement. Uh, on, on the different parts of these different bills that we have will address parts of this problem that we have. So I'm going to ask us as quickly as possible to the, the BS of the bills discussed today demonstrate a variety of options for approaching toxic exposure treatment in the VA. The team act creates a process for the VA to determine illnesses for which deaths would be presumed to be eligible for healthcare benefits if they serve in specific locations. Alternatively, the preemptive, presumptive benefits for war fighters exposed to burn pits and other toxic toxin acts create a list of illnesses that should be covered immediately depending on the service location. Where, what is your prefer, preferred approach? Uh, if we could have it, um, the witness, please say, uh, starting with, um, someone take a shot, but we could start with Mr. Morosky, please. Thank you, Congressman. And thank you for asking that very important question. You know, um, some of the bills that you mentioned when we talk about, let's say the Warfighters Act, uh, the Team Act, the Burn Pits Recognition Act, we don't see these as, as competing or alternative bills at all. Quite the contrary, we see them as complementary bills, which are all doing different things and which are all necessary for different veterans. So for instance, uh, the Warfighters Act would give uh, presumptive uh, service connection for any veteran that has any one of these long list of conditions of cancers or respiratory conditions. Um, however, if a veteran has another condition that they'd like to claim uh, associated with burn pit exposure, like a heart condition, let's say, uh, they would be helped greatly by having concession of exposure and any 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 sort of claim that's you know not on the list of presumptions would benefit from concession of exposure and then of course everybody who is exposed regardless of their service connected disability claim status should have access permanent access to va health care um, if nothing else for for, for 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 you know preventative care these are all things that vietnam veterans have uh we think that you know the the, the, the current generation should have parity so the answer is, is all of the above sir yeah thank you uh let me see um Mr. Uh, Mr. Hoare, Travis Hoare, please. Yes, thank you, sir. I, uh, I would agree with Wounded Warrior. Um, these are not separate options. We believe that these are all complementary of each other, and uh, the current generation of veterans need these things now as far as health care and presumptive of illness to protect those veterans that are sick now, and also to establish that framework in the TEAM Act in order to protect these veterans in the future. It's, it's critically important to ensure that there's not another you know, for example, 20 year lag time from when we started the war in Afghanistan to now to get that presumptive of illness. We need to ensure that it, that process is a lot quicker than decades. Thank you. Ms. Keenan, please. Yes, thank you, sir. I, we just want to echo the same thing that um, a lot of what we want to achieve can, can happen through um, implementing several of these bills. Um, it's true that Vietnam veterans have access to these same benefits and services. We want that for this for all generations of veterans, but we don't want it to take decades to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Learman, I miss Ms. Learman. Yeah, Sharon Shane Learman. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I, I agree with my colleagues today. Uh, none of these are going to be the answer by themselves. Together, they will address a lot of these issues from now and in the future. They're not competing, they're complementary, and we need them all. Thank you. Um, um, I'm going to take a chance here. Mr. Price, I'm out of time, but um, do you have something to add, sir? Thank you, Congressman. I just want to concur with the other VSOs that we agree. Um, specifically, I do want to mention that, that everybody has said a lot that this is this era's Agent Orange. And to remember that that term is not used lightly. Uh, it's used in reference to the over the 30 years that the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, took to lawfully acknowledge the effects of Agent Orange. And that's what we don't want this to become. Right. I learned that actually on, when I served in Congress, that's when I learned that. And then I'm still confused over the blue Missouri, um, you know, law where the line starts. At. But uh, thank you very much for your testimony, uh, Chairman Capano. Uh, and everyone for bearing me a you back. Thank you, Mr. Sublime. Uh, I now call on uh, Dr. Ruiz for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman Takano, and thank you to the VSO representatives for your dedication and advocacy on behalf of our nation's heroes. And a very special thank you to Mr. Price for your and your wife Lauren's testimony, uh, and we're, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, I represent the eastern part of Riverside County in Southern California, which has a large veteran population. I think is is in the top 11 county with most veterans in the nation. Uh, and as an emergency medicine physician, helping ensure veterans have access to high quality care is one of my highest priorities since the get go. That includes making sure that our veterans who are exposed to harmful toxins during their service to our country get the critical health care needed for their war illnesses. This is why Senator Gillibrand and I reintroduced the presumptive benefits for war fighters exposed to burn pits and other toxic exposures act of 2021, along with our Republican colleagues, Senator Rubio and Congressman Fitzpatrick. We cannot simply pay lip service to our war heroes and thank them for their service. We owe them the health care and benefits that they earned when we sent them to war for our country. Anything less then presumption of service connection for toxic exposures is not acceptable. Let me repeat that. Anything less than presumption of service connection for toxic exposures is not acceptable. Mr. Hoare, uh, you're from the Iraq, Afghanistan uh, Veterans uh, of America. Can you articulate the importance of the establishment of presumption of service connection for veterans exposed to burn pits and other toxic exposures? Yes, thank you very much, Congressman, for one working so closely at reintroducing the presumptive, uh, the Warfighters Act uh, is one of IVA's top priorities to ensure we, I want to echo your statement that anything less than a presumptive of illness uh, is is not acceptable for IVA. Uh, the presumptive of illness would open up uh, so much for veterans that are currently sick uh, or is sick in the future. Um, proving the illness, as I mentioned before, can be extremely difficult because of the time that has lapsed or lacking DOD records that would take that burden of proof off of the veteran. Um, and they don't, they no longer have to wait for all of these research studies to be done, uh, which may never link 100% because of all of the issues with the research uh, that our previous panel had mentioned that we've had in the past that we've run into before. Uh, Additionally, it will encourage veterans to come forward with their claim as VA wants because they know they don't have to go through this bureaucratic red tape to prove all of these different things that they were exposed, that they are sick, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe all of these reasons are why a presumptive illness is so important. Thank you, Ms. Keenan. Uh, can you think, do you think uh, that it is premature, as mentioned uh, previously, for the VA to support toxic exposure legislation? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, we absolutely do not think it's premature. We, we are actually disappointed that VA hasn't taken the opportunity in, in this and last week's hearing to express um, their feelings about these bills. We'd like to work together with them to come up with a solution. But to be honest, you know, the train has left the station. Um, we really believe that comprehensive toxic, toxic exposure legislation can and will pass this Congress. And we're gonna continue to advocate and, for that. You know, uh, how can the VA be more transparent with implementing its framework for responding to veterans exposed to toxic exposures? Mrs. Uh, Keenan. Again, we, we don't wanna wait, um, you know, for VA to try to come up with yet another plan and then, you know, find the statistics and find out to see, see if it's effective or not. We really think that legislation has worked in the past and it will work in the future. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Keenan, as you know, I've, uh, Found, co-founded the uh, Bipartisan Burn Pits Caucus. And for many years, I've laid out a framework, uh, a public health scientific approach to the issue of burn pits. There's four pillars to that framework that I've been speaking for so many years. One is to end the exposures to the burn pits, to the agent that's causing harm. Two is aggressively educate through outreach to service members and veterans exposed to toxins and trained providers and personnel in DOD and VA and the general public. Three is take care of our patients, provide the healthcare and the benefits to our veterans. And four,
do the research to understand the full gamut of illnesses caused by hundreds of chemicals that have that our veterans have been exposed to so those are four pillars and approaches of a framework that i've been speaking about for many many years and if we take those as pillars as a as a, a committee then we will ensure that we address this issue once and for all with that i yield back my time thank you dr ruiz uh, I now recognize uh, the chair of our health subcommittee, uh, Chairwoman Brownlee, for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this uh, important hearing. It's just, to me, it's indefensible that uh, the men and women who serve in our military um, who are already at risk of injury or death uh, in fighting the enemy are then put at further risk uh being exposed uh to these burn pits and and toxic exposures and i think if this kind of thing happened outside of the military it would be a culpable action um and it's just an imperative uh that we act on this and act on this immediately that's why we have a va um is to serve our veterans and they they deserve this and i think you know the military is not culpable typically they're protected um and but this we must we must uh pursue this so um um mr hoare you know in your opening comments you talked about 88 percent of your members have been exposed uh to toxic exposures and probably more burn pits than anything else and you talked about your own your own particular uh story around that you know when you say 88 percent is that you know people who were doing the same job that you were doing as you described it or is it people on a base where the burn pit was actually occurring and so generally everybody was exposed i, I i'm trying to get my arms kind of around that Yes, Congresswoman, thank you for the question. And it is that that larger gamut of exposure. Um, by the VA's own estimates, I think it's three and a half million veterans are eligible for the burn pit registry, which essentially lines up with every veteran that's deployed post 9-11 or since the Gulf War, uh, excuse me, the 1990. Um, so it is that larger group. And we're seeing health effects from everybody, from the people that were burning the burn pit to the people that were sleeping by it, the people that um, never even saw one, but it was on their base somewhere. And I've heard stories where, you know, on bases there were burn pits, but there were, uh, you know, millions of dollars of incinerators sitting on that base that weren't being utilized just because burn pits are, are more convenient and easier and, and perhaps faster. So um, again, uh, culpability, but, um, Mr. Murawski, you talked about, uh, you know, preventive care, and I, I'm not quite sure exactly what you mean in terms of preventive care. If somebody's been exposed, they know that they've been exposed. Is are, are there, you know, medical procedures that can be done to um, help mitigate possible disease? You know, I think I'm really just referring to, you know, having access to to a primary care doctor at the VA who's aware that you've been exposed to toxic substances. And, you know, I mean, I think cancers, especially in some of these, you know, respiratory conditions that are caught with routine testing uh, have much better prognosis than when a veteran has no access to VA because they've timed out of their five years. And then they're so ill that they have nowhere to go except the emergency room when they have nowhere else to turn. And usually, you know, serious life-threatening illnesses that are diagnosed at that stage, uh, you know, the prognosis is very bad. So what we'd like to do is bring everybody in that was exposed, have them be able to have access to routine testing so we can catch things earlier and save more lives. Uh, Congresswoman. Yeah, th thank you so much. And, uh, you know, Mr. Price, I weep with you um, in terms of the loss of your wife. Um, uh, you know, my heart breaks as all of our hearts uh, break uh, for you. Um, and the loss of your loved one. And it sounds as though you guys had a wonderful marriage and were connected at the hip uh, for a very long time and shared uh, many similar experiences. So 
um, it's a very difficult loss. And um, if, if you could just tell me exactly uh, what Lauren did um, to be exposed um, uh, to toxins. Yes, Congresswoman, thank you. Um, Lauren was uh, several items within our unit over there. Uh, she was basically the lead administrator for the company, um, which at times took on numerous roles. She was the uh, motor pool battalion leader and she would take vehicle parts over to the burn pit. Um, uh, the, the burn pit really wasn't that far away from the dining facility. It really wasn't that far away from the main gate when we were coming in and out of going on convoys, uh, depending upon which direction the wind was blowing, we could smell it at night while, we, while, you know, everybody was in their hooches sleeping for the dining. Um, so it was, it was not one particular task. I would say that uh, caused her, her exposure. There were some that were higher. Uh, but it was mostly just the fact that the burn pit was actually on base uh, right at the fob where we were at thank you mr price and um I, i'm out of time i yield back mr chairman uh, thank you ms brownlee uh we want to uh welcome back uh i haven't seen this uh, member for quite a while but we welcome you back mr Velarakis. yasis if Kati stole for all of your contributions to the committee over the years, and uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And uh, I, you spoke to my uh, to my heritage, and uh, and uh, I will tell you that uh, our Easter was this past Sunday, and we say Christos Anesti, which means Christ has arisen. Thank you very oh. much. Thanks for having me here. Uh, and I also want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member for inviting my good friend uh, Jim Price, uh, to testify before the committee. Uh, and I will tell you that, uh, that Lauren and Jim worked so very hard on this issue. As a matter of fact, Lauren testified before our VA committee a few years back. And also she was, uh, part of our round table discussions as well uh, on several issues with regard to the VA. Uh, and I, I've worked with Dr. Ruiz, as you know, uh, along with Lauren, of course, and Jim, uh, on this issue, the burn pit issue for many years. And uh, we, it's time to get it done. It's time to get it done. Uh, my son taught me a new term. I hope I use it in the right context uh, the other day, uh, a new term, let's go, let's go. Well, let's go get this done for our heroes. So I appreciate it very much. I've always said that, and, and I've heard this several times, toxic exposures from burn pits uh, is an Agent Orange issue of our era. It is the Agent Orange issue of our area. Veterans suffering from negative health effects from these burn pits do not have decades to wait for the medical treatment and benefits they deserve. They cannot wait decades for the VA to take action on burn pit exposure. They need the help now. So uh, I'm glad the committee, of course, invited uh, Jim Price to testify this morning and give his family story. Mr. Price is one of my constituents, as I, you, you said before, Mr. Chairman, and I've known him for many years. Uh, and of course, very close to his late wife, Lauren, as well, uh, and, and the organization that they founded. Uh, I was so saddened to hear about Lauren's passing. Um, again, she was a very close friend. And we spoke, we spoke before her passing and I promised her that I was gonna do everything I can to get this issue across the finish line. And I will. And with your leadership, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and ranking member, I know it's gonna get done. Uh, again, she was, uh, she was the best of all of us and a, a true American hero. May her memory be eternal. To honor her legacy, again, I want to get this done now. We will lose more heroes the longer we wait. We must provide the support needed for veterans suffering from burn pit exposure and create a system going forward that will comprehensively examine toxic exposure so that the future generations of veterans will get their benefits, uh, the benefits they need and they have earned. So I firmly believe 
uh, that the Team Act and all these bills uh, will do just that. So my first question is for uh, Jim Price. Your family has an incredible record of service to our country. I wanna thank you, sir, for your service as well. While Congress has pushed the VA to do better by veterans exposed to burn pit toxins, it is currently failing uh, those veterans by not providing them the so desperate, uh, this, they desperately need these benefits. But more importantly, as you said, Jim, uh, the health care immediately. You have already expressed your support for the Team Act here today, sir. But can you elaborate again why you believe the systematic changes in the bill, both for health care and for benefits, would better have helped you and your family? Again, uh, your family, the relatives that are around, but also your good friends. I consider all our veterans family. So if you could respond to that, I would appreciate it, sir. Thank you, Congressman. Um, probably the one thing that's, that's least known about uh, everything that happened with Warren, uh, she was not rated for constricted bronchiolitis. Uh, she was rated 100%, um, but when she received her 100% rating, bronchi uh, constricted bronchiolitis was not in the rating tables by the VA. So there was actually nothing specifically in her rating that, um, was as a res direct result from burn pits. Obviously, we know that there were conditions that, that came up over the years that were from that. Um, and by, the, again, the big thing with the TEAM Act is that it takes a, a location and a time and service and, and grants immediate health care for that. Um, because had, uh, had we not been lucky enough to be in the position where we were in to get care, Lauren potentially could have had a hard time receiving care from the VA due to her ex toxic exposure conditions. Oh, wait, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for letting me wave on, and I appreciate uh, everything you've done. And uh, let's let's do more for our veterans. Thank you. I'll yield back. Thank you, uh, Representative Villarakis. And uh, I thank all of the witnesses for being here today. Um, I, before, I, uh, before I make my concluding remarks, uh, I want to invite uh, Ranking Member Boss to uh, have uh, you know, a, a final reflection on today's hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to each one of you, uh, the witnesses that were provided your views on this important bill, all these important bills. I appreciate the VA for explaining the improvement the department is making for toxic exposed veterans, but those are not, those are good changes, but these changes are not enough. We must move forward with legislation like the TEAMS Act so that the veterans do not need to wait any longer for care and benefits that they need. I'm committed to working with the chairman, the members of the committee, with our colleagues in the Senate, to get the Teams Act or legislation like it to the president's desk as soon as possible. As we've expressed today, it's gotta be sooner than later. And uh, I think that has been very, very clear from the members that spoke here today, as well as the people, our veterans, VSOs who are involved. And uh, thank you for having the hearing today, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Bost. I certainly appreciated the participation uh, of all members of the committee. And I am very grateful uh, to the, for the testimony of today's witnesses on all the panels and uh, to those, especially on uh, this third panel, uh, the personal stories uh, that you uh, conveyed, um, again, uh, are gonna, are very, in my opinion, are extremely impactful, are gonna inspire our members to continue to work together in a bipartisan way uh, we certainly appreciate uh, always the voices of our veteran service organizations. Um, you know, veterans are a, a sacred issue uh, in the Congress, and uh, members uh, members risk uh, risk big things if they if they if they uh, tread too heavily on that sacredness. And so we we know it's hallowed ground. Uh, uh, the service and the sacrifice of veterans um, are, are, are hallowed territory. 
So um, the 15 bills on the agenda today do offer a blueprint for our comprehensive legislative package. I'm gonna say this, 2021 should be the year and it will be the year we pass comprehensive legislation that meets the needs of all veterans, current and future, who are exposed to toxic substances while serving our country. I'm hopeful that what will come out of this is comprehensive reform of the benefits process for military toxic exposures, a reform by which our nation's veterans can trust that their government is looking out for their best interests and will honor our promise to support those who have borne the battle. Thank you again to all the witnesses for joining us today. And I look forward uh, to the work ahead. Um, I just want to say that all members will have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. Thanks again for your appearing before us today. And this hearing now stands adjourned. <laughs>